I went out for a friend's birthday last night and because we're having a heat wave in London at the moment and no one knows quite how to kind of deal with it and everyone is just sort of taking this kind of faintly feral once it's over 25 degrees nothing you do counts um kind of kind of line um so we're all Scott Fitzgerald rules yeah, yeah exactly everyone everyone is on Everyone is on fucking Tennessee Williams rules. Like no one is <laughs> like no one is behaving normally. Everyone is just like kind of lying, like kind of lying in their own sweat, being like, I wanna fight or I wanna fuck. Um, <laughs> but it's too hot it's too hot to do either of those things. Running out on terraces, yelling off of balconies, things of that nature. Yeah, yeah. yeah. things of things of think think exactly, things of that nature. Re- and revealing so their partner's latent instead. homosexuality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, all of that happened. All of that, all of that went on. Um and it also means that I, because I'm not, I'm not someone with a particularly good resistance to alcohol anyway, because mm. uh, I am not, I am not a large person. Um, so like literally just like two beers in this heat and I'm just like, it's time, it's <laughs> so time. <laughs> and then like on the way, and then like we were out at this pub, it's like an hour and a half walk away from, uh, from our house. And we're like, let's, let's take some acid and walk home. Yes, hell that's yes. That's what we're going to do. That's, yes. what we're, that's That's the vibe of the night. Like halfway through the walk, there was this like incredible like summer storm. And so we were just like plugging through the like the pouring rain with like the kind of the rolling thunder, like tripping balls and just being like, this is, this is like so magical. I'm so happy that I live here. <laughs> and then when I got home, I didn't drink any water. So now I'm hungover. That's nice. my <laughs> that's my that's my complaint for the day. <laughs> so many possible worlds, but we got this one. So many possible worlds, but we got this one. Welcome to the worst of all possible worlds, the first and only podcast hot enough for a Tennessee Williams fighter fuck. I'm the worst of all possible AJs. I'm the worst of all possible Brian's. And I'm the worst of all possible Josh's. And we are so excited uh, for yet another installment of Wit's Endless Summer. Yes, indeed. We're back uh, Mm -hmm. listening to more episodes of Adventures in Odyssey, the evangelical Christian radio drama. And with us today, we have a very special guest who... uh, We've actually been looking forward to having on for some time as we've done a number of collaborations with her recently uh, on her shows. Mm-hmm. And it is the one, the only Phoebe Roy. Hello. Welcome, Phoebe. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Before we like get into today's episodes, Phoebe, why don't you just talk a little bit about sort of what you do in terms of your podcasts and also then maybe what listening to this really exciting series of episodes sort of felt like how did it hit you sort of right out the gate sure yeah. sure felt it felt felt good um <laughs> yeah, i am a i am a uh, writer and like I, I know you have to say podcaster i prefer broadcaster because it sounds a little less virginal and i think that's something which i feel <laughs> like at this stage in my life i have to be very very clear i have to be clear about that um do you mind if we also start using that because i also i also feel like broadcaster sounds so much more sophisticated (laughs) like i should be in a suit so much more sophisticated yeah like i'm a broadcaster i'm a broadcaster also it means that like my parents can tell their friends what i'm Mm, doing now mm -hmm. without cringing and that's something that i something that i feel you know is like really important to, to to give to them you know they've they've done a lot for me in my life so i really feel like i can i can i can do this one thing for them i don't i the one thing i can do for my mum and dad is not force them to explain to their friends and colleagues what a podcast is like yeah, that's yeah, not yeah, something yeah. That, that i wish to inflict <laughs> yeah we, 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 we love of them. we love making our parents lives easier here that's uh yeah yeah exactly like i'm a good daughter <laughs> and that's what and so so i am a broadcaster you um, you may know me from uh my two podcasts that i co-host uh Ten Thousand posts which is uh a show about well it's a show about posting but it's a show about digital culture and online culture and how that inflects with culture in the so-called real world and how that inflects with politics and um it sort of hinges on the thesis that everything is posting something which i'm starting to think is more and more the case with every episode that we do (laughs) and uh my other pod is uh masters of our domain which is a podcast about Seinfeld, my finger is super glued to the pulse on this one. Um, Seinfeld finished in 1997. And Mm -hmm. quite frankly, I think it's time to have a little bit of a revisit because I think it's going to take off 
I feel like there are good things for this Larry David guy. I feel like there's, oh yeah, 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 I feel yeah, like yeah. there are good things in his bright future yeah. ahead of him. Really yeah, bright a, a future. Big future, a big future for uh, their producer Steve Bannon. Um, oh God! <laughs> when we started, when we started doing the show, we got like a couple of people messaging us and saying, like, "Do you know that Steve Bannon owns some of the rights mm. to Seinfeld?" So, like, he technically, what? like, you're, like you're, like you're giving him money, and like, I responded to one of them and said, "Well, yeah, that's true, but that's just because like I'm blocked from sending him money any other way, um, <laughs> and like it just it, that just did, like didn't go down that well. So now we just like ignore it as a kind of like we just don't have to deal with that. This is not. But we are on more than one, um, more than one Twitter list um, under fascists, which I think is oh, very funny. Oh yeah. yes." So oh, I, I don't think we've quite think cracked cool. that yet. Are yeah. we on any lists? Do we know? Who knows? Who knows? Lists are so mysterious. You know, oh, they're so they're, they're sort of like they've got numbers. They they mm. exist partially within the spirit realm, and they only appear when you feed them. You know, berries, thistles, things of that nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Phoebe, it's what so great happening? to have you on to talk about this show because mm. this is much more contemporary than Seinfeld. Because it's yep. still running today. There are still new episodes of Adventures in Odyssey being made as mm -hmm. we speak, even though these episodes that we're listening to are from 1994. Yeah. Anno oh, Domini. Wow, okay. I'm assuming you came into this without any familiarity with uh, evangelical Christian entertainment, or am I incorrect about <laughs> that? What are you, what are you that? talking about? This is my favorite show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had like I'd never I'd never heard of this this show yeah. before uh, before Josh sent me the uh, sent me the MP3s. Um, me neither. I, I was <laughs> I, like I found I found it a really disorienting listen. It sort of it kind of made me feel a little bit like it, it reminded me of being like a child. And really, really loving Sesame Street, but like imagine mm. if Sesame Street like bummed you out. <laughs> like that's that's kind yeah. of what I that's kind of what I got from listening to because like cause I couldn't work out who like at first it took me like it took me a minute to like work out kind of who the characters were because I had this like little primer that I was like referring back right. to mm -hmm. and uh, I was listening to the first couple of episodes I was off doing my mum and dad's watering they don't live they don't, they don't live in London they live somewhere else making them proud left and right mm -hmm. yeah I had to drive out there and do their watering for them so I was listening to it like as I was. As mm -hmm. I was driving out and as I was watering. Mm. Oh, you were and listening like, to it in the car. That is the optimal way yeah. to listen to yeah. Adventures in Odyssey. Listening yeah. to Oh, is that is that the correct way of doing it? Okay, well yes, that was unintentional. Absolutely. It just it just so happened that yeah. that was the time I had free to listen. And I was uh, and and I kept like sort of saying, like, what wait, what? Go wait, go back. Go back. <laughs> what? This is I'm go I'm going I'm going back here because like every because every time I thought I had a kind of handle on what the line was going to be and like what narrative point they were going to make next, I was mm -hmm. always wrong. I like every single, every single prediction I made, I was just like, this is, oh, I'm complete, I'm completely incorrect here. Um, <laughs> and I, th and I found it and I found it really, I found it a really, really fascinating and really disorienting listen, I think. <laughs> So your it. your experience yeah. was basically the opposite of Hussein, who listened a couple weeks ago, came on our show and correctly predicted every single thing that will be <laughs> happening in future episodes of this show. And also um, weirdly predicted my lore that I made up for <laughs> this show. Amazing. OK. Would it be a shock to you, Phoebe, that these are some of the best episodes that we've listened to of the show. Oh my god. What does a bad, what does a bad episode sound like? Oh, oh boy. Buddy. Oh boy. Yeah. AJ and they your did estimation. an abortion episode. We can certainly play that one again. If, yeah, is uh, that is that oh. one the worst for you, AJ? The abortion one? Yeah. Ah, uh, probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, these episodes are not very ideological, mm. except for the proverbs that hits you at the end in the yeah, face yeah, like yeah, a yeah. fish. Yeah. The, these are all sequential episodes, which we don't usually do. We usually take a grab bag out of the last, you know, couple hundred of these because this we we begin this one with episode two hundred and seventy four. But this section is a a part of the show that was recorded because their main actor had passed away. And they were trying to figure out what are we going to do next. And so this okay. is what they did. They made a road trip with two two of the one of the main characters and one of the side characters. There's almost like a lack of 
like a central mm. thing to to coalesce around. Like it, it feels a little bit scattered relative to some of the other episodes that we've talked about. So the first episode that we're listening to, First Hand Experience, written by Paul mm-hmm. McCusker, episode 274, features Bernard, uh, our long suffering window washer. He is wrapping up business to basically head out of town for a couple weeks. And Eugene, our uh, spectrumy polymath, uh, is also leaving Odyssey for a while. And uh, we sort of get an interaction between them here, framing up what the stakes are going to be. You're leaving Odyssey? Precisely. For good? Well, that depends. It depends on what? What happens on my expedition? Expedition? Eugene, just do me a favor and speak clearly for a minute. Now, when you say expedition, you don't mean a trip to deepest, darkest Africa looking oh, for purple boy. Oh, You gosh. really mean <laughs> taking a vacation. Oh, boy. Right? <laughs> well, I'd like to think of this journey as something more than simply a vacation. This is an expedition to go beyond seeing tourist sites or attractive scenery to connect with the inner person. A journey to myself. Sounds like a pretty short trip. But um, uh, there, there's a lot of things recently that we've been listening to in Odyssey where they just keep using that phrase "deepest darkest Africa," and I need it to yeah. stop. I need them to stop. Uh, does it? Does great. it? They won't. They won't. Oh, oh, good. Happen. Do they ever go? Do they ever go to Africa on the show? Do they ever do like a missionary uh, apparently, trip? Apparently, yes. Oh, actually, no. Uh, no. yeah. This is this is after Josh's in my time, but there there are certain plot points that I don't want to reveal to you, AJ, mostly because I don't want them to exist even to myself. But yeah, there is an extended <laughs> extended plot where Eugene specifically goes to Africa. So, like Ernest, you know, like yeah, he, he's done yeah, all the yeah. other ones. He got scared stupid. He went to jail. He went to camp and now he's going to Africa. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Are the Ernest films big in the UK, Phoebe? Do you uh, do you all have like have, Ernest Fest? I have no idea what that is. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ernest might be to America as Mr. Blobby is to the UK. It just kind of doesn't okay, translate. Yeah, all right. I mean, it's not really, but all like right, that, that's something yeah. I can understand. Like you have to. Fr- this is this is you, you know, this you have to frame everything to me in terms of how similar it is to Mr. Blobby. And then I can. Understand. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, uh, <laughs> this is now the stakes set pretty quickly, right? Eugene, yeah. uh, and we'll remember from previous episodes that Eugene's been having a bit of a personal crisis of faith, right? Mm-hmm. He's yeah. considering loving the Lord. Um, yeah, but and- also he he was considering loving a woman and then she decided that she would rather love the Lord than him. Right. Yep. Uh, that woman, so Milhouse Van Houten. Voiced by Pamela Hayden, yes. And uh, so my question uh, for you, Phoebe, is like, how much of this was legible in terms of like immediate hmm. stakes without knowing all of this backstory? Part of it was legible because, um, and I know that this is the 90s, but this is something tells me that if these episodes had been written and recorded now, it wouldn't be so very different. It is <laughs> quite one of the most... Uh, extraordinarily offensive depictions of neurodivergence I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> yeah. um, like the second, the second Eugene starts speaking, I'm like, oh, okay, what's up? What's up? What's up with what's up with this fella? He yeah. seems a little overly literal. Yeah. Um, he mm-hmm. seems to be. Oh, oh, what he's a uh, he's studying computer science. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Oh, I wonder. Uh, oh, oh, how how's he doing on the. Uh, on the on the eye contact front is that something that we're gonna uh is he gonna is he gonna come up with all sorts of like tiresome reasons not to not to be kind of that into evangelical christianity that after you listen to him like a bit you're a bit like you know what maybe you could talk me around on the evangelical christianity front because you're so annoying that every (laughs) single one of your of your kind of points against it just just make me think yeah but Maybe. Maybe the Earth is 6,000 years old. I don't know. Yeah, you, don't know. you've intuited it. That, that's exactly right. Like, like, he, yeah, he, like he, he I, gets there through force of sheer annoyingness. Yeah, yeah like, yeah. What, what am I, a mathematician? I don't know how old the Earth is. Like. <laughs> We've had so many guests on this show, and you're the first one to have Eugene Meltzner hatred, and it is a breath of fresh air. Uh, uh, mostly because I, I will agree that Will Ryan does a uh, really excellent job, but I also think that Eugene gene sort of anchoring these episodes you do kind of get to a point where it's like okay we need to he's better as a side character do you mm-hmm. know what i mean like this is know. this is a lot of eugene it's a lot of bernard and they don't i don't think they quite know how to sustain the bernard energy either yeah no. 
they they kind of sideline him for a couple episodes. But, you know, in this first one, it's th- this one I feel like is sort of the strongest there dynamic wise because it is all about their dynamic where really they're kind of just like guest stars in the rest of the episodes mm-hmm. because they become oh, about okay. the sort of fixing people across the country. Yeah, sort of like Jimmy Savile. They, they go <laughs> and they fix this. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh. Bernard will fix it. <laughs> he will, literally that's his job <laughs> oh lord Eugene wants to go on this journey to himself Bernard's like okay fine I'll drive you to the bus station we'll go to Connellsville you can catch the bus there Eugene and, has a literal bindle it's revealed yes. like he he's like like oh like rucksack over his shoulder carrying like nine computers and a microscope on their way over Bernard sort of grills Eugene a little bit on what he's hoping to get out of this experience I still can't figure out why in the world you're doing this. I mean, you're getting on a bus to anywhere for for what? For the experience. That's it, huh? Just experience? Nothing else? Yes. Well, it's been my experience that experience for the sake of experience usually isn't a very good experience at all. I beg your pardon? Unless there's a reason for your experience, a purpose, or you learn something from them, then, well, there's not much point. Naturally? I disagree. Yeah, well, naturally you would. Phoebe, I have a question for you. Hmm. Did you learn anything from doing acid and walking down the street uh, with the rain falling on your face? Oh, no, nothing at all. Yeah, I but kept you would my, say it was my... still a worthwhile experience. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, because it was really fun. Suck it, Bernard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. This is Get actually his ass. something that, this is actually something that I like I don't want to like jump around the episode too much. Yeah. But mm-hmm. this is something that I actually found really like really interesting in terms of not knowing where it was like where it was going. Because mm. I absolutely thought, okay, well, where they're going with this is uh is that experiences are valuable in and of themselves there's mm-hmm. an inherent mm-hmm. value to uh, to experiencing things and particularly if you're sort of taking it as a kind of a like all experiences are a kind of are, are no matter what they are they are a kind of potential for learning for uh for spiritual and emotional and mental nourishment and enrichment and all experiences are given to you by uh, given to you by god and therefore you Mm. are meant to make the most of whatever experience is kind of being given to you without asking too many questions and that's not that's not the moral no, of the episode no, at all. No, no, no. So, it completely, yeah. it completely threw me that that <laughs> the extent to which that is the opposite of the moral of the mm-hmm. episode. Well, and it's so funny because Bernard's counter, in addition to this like experience for the sake of experience, isn't a very good experience. Is is like he's like okay, so let me let me contrast what you are doing with what I'm doing because right. I'm also traveling. I have a reason for my trip. I'm going to San Diego to get a great deal on a new pickup truck. Better than any deal I could get in Odyssey. Along the way, it's just me and the peace and quiet of the open road. And what I hope to learn from the experience is how to get a great price on a new truck. So in our own separate ways, we are both pilgrims. You're a pilgrim. I'm just a truck buyer. Hmm. And you believe that this truck will endure the entire distance? Well, of course it will. This old truck has never let me down. Foreshadowing. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But also, like, you listen to Bernard, and it's it's clearly this is not the moral of the episode. These are the words of an insane, grumpy old man. (laughs) This is (laughs) there is no way the episode is going to come around and be like, actually, this thing Bernard said. It's kind of as a tossed off joke. This is is, what this is what you're supposed to take from it. This is Christ's will for you and me. (laughs) (laughs) I. I can't tell you how quickly I threw my headphones off my head <laughs> when I heard that they were going to San Diego. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I feel like the show knows that I specifically am listening <laughs> and wants to let me know that it knows what I'm doing. Uh, I, I, I cannot believe the specificity of San Diego. Is it just because it's like the lowest corner of the country that you can go uh, on the west coast uh, is that like maybe is it just so they, they get the most distance out of it or like i don't know i phoebe do you have any frame of reference for the great city of san diego california i've i've been to san diego very oh, briefly oh, oh yeah. cool it's, it's nice 
It's Did not, you go to the zoo? Uh, no, because we were oh, only like we were like very passing nice. through. We went to the beach. It's very nice. I saw <laughs> I saw amazing. a play yeah. recently that described San Diego as if the color beige were a town. And I can't, I don't think I can describe it any better than that. But <laughs> Wait, did you see a play that said that? Or did you write that? I didn't write that. That's what makes me so mad. <laughs> I'll never write a line better than that about my hometown. I'm going to start doing that, though. I'm going to be like, I was listening to this podcast where they said blah, 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 blah. And I'll just be quoting myself. I like that. I think that's a really good way of doing things. Um, yeah, no, a wise it, man once said, uh, yeah. that's not the way a professional broadcaster behaves. No, Josh. no, it's not. As our as our resident San Diego boy, AJ. Yeah. Any other thoughts about this choice beyond, whoa, that's wild. I am being watched. Well, I mean, the other thing, too, is that like San Diego is a pretty conservative town all yeah, things yeah. considered yeah, yeah, you know yeah. it is a military town we have kent pendleton there we have mm -hmm. uh what we refer to as the nuclear tits that sit midway between us and camp pendleton that uh after 9 11 happened we were like well that's clearly what's next mm. and we all <laughs> thought that we were all under attack as well in the way as, that I think as everyone all of america knows san diego is our biggest treasure yeah, it's truly America's <laughs> finest city and that it is the most fine. <laughs> like it was probably appealing to that base. Also, you know, you're in your car a lot in San Diego and they weren't going to reach the godless he heathens of L.A. You know, no, Dobson no, has his no. sort of vendetta against them anyway. So yeah. why not go for like the conservative little brother and be like, oh, hey, that's us. Like, you know, the, the recognition of when you're listening to it in the car. Well, and speaking of conservative California, you know, Eugene has this bus ticket that you mm -hmm. can just take any bus anywhere at any time for, I don't know, a, a select period. Yeah. And he at the Connellsville bus terminal just decides he's going to spin around a bunch and then point to the map and his finger lands on Bakersfield, California. Mm hmm. Another very conservative California town. Yeah. Uh, my uh my my really good friend has a lot of relatives in Bakersfield and he would go to them every year for Christmas and he would lose cell re reception so yes. we would just not hear from him and he'd come back and we we're like how was it he's like well you know the Basques and I'm like I don't I don't know the Basques <laughs> <laughs> oh sunny Bakersfield city of bakers you know what they say about Bakersfield right no what, what do they say Brian what do they say Brian <laughs> it's the biggest city in Oklahoma. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> I love I love to just like having watching Phoebe sort of sit here, enjoy all yeah. these regional references. Oh, and yeah. Just, well, look, oh, just yeah, having no, to... no, I'm having a I'm having a I'm having I'm having a great time. And this is all completely understandable to me. Yeah, as well. yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> who, who, who in the world does not know about good old Baco? Who doesn't want to go to a Blaze game and smoke meth or whatever the third activity is that you do in Bakersfield, California. Spoilers, it's meth. Who, who doesn't who doesn't want to live out the plot of the Hills Have Eyes in Oildale? I don't know if we have any listeners in Bakersfield, but I did this all for you. We don't you. anymore. Thank you. <laughs> so, they part ways uh, at the bus terminal, Eugene and Bernard, right? And um, Eugene boards the bus, sits next to a guy, and proceeds to talk at him. I want to take it all in, experience as much as I can. Really? Oh, yes. You see, I haven't traveled much in my life, except for that trip to Latin America, of course, which was born out of specific circumstances. No kidding. Which Continuity. I don't have to go into now. Thank you. Uh, the, it does this, like, little elliptical musical cut, and it comes back to Eugene talking about what? Transit systems? <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes! He's talking about the construction of the inter interstate highway system and how it decimated our rail infrastructure, which is my number one favorite subject. I identify with this man so strongly at first. Um, yeah, I think, you know, honestly, I think this is why I don't. This is why I don't like him because it's like mm. it's the narcissism of small differences. Because yeah. like this is just this is just this is just like me for real. Like I will, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will, whatever my special weird interest is at the time I will trap someone and I will talk to them about it until they actively like stop me it's the mortifying <laughs> ordeal of being known things of that yeah. nature yeah, it is the mortifying ordeal of uh, being directly described by a character in um, <laughs> an evangelical radio drama I think uh, it's not something that I ever thought was going to happen to me so yeah we spend some time on this bus uh, Eugene, what, you, what is happening is Eugene is basically striker an airplane right he's bored people with all yes. of his details but instead of them all killing themselves they they go to the bathroom <laughs> and never come back because 
presumably they're dying in there right natural causes <laughs> Natural they're hanging themselves and pouring gasoline over themselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very crowded. Uh, it starts there. Their bodies <laughs> yeah. falling out of the bathroom at this point. <laughs> then we we get some time with Bernard. Yeah. Wonder what's on the radio. You're telling me that it was some kind of accident that you robbed that store and the two supermarkets? Come on. Yeah, next. Yes. Anything and everything you ever wanted in a watch is contained in Super Watch. Next. Oh, this sounds no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hey, wait a minute. Don't fade now. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. The, the moment that they did that gag, I was like, AJ is going to have thoughts on the internal lore you implications can't have of this. Odyssey within Odyssey. <laughs> that what? What happened? And he kept listening. Would it have been his voice like slightly <laughs> delayed? Like, what are the implications? Is, is, is Wynn actually manufacturing this whole show? within the show? Oh, maybe I, the whole thing's happening inside of the Room of Consequences. No, 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 no. Everything, everything, it's all just stored on magnetic tape. It's mm. just a constantly running thousands of reels they of tape. They can't keep doing this to me. <laughs> Phoebe, your thoughts on the lore implications of uh, Bernard hearing his own life on the radio? That, that's that's sort of that's sort of getting complicated, isn't it? That's like that's like getting a little bit kind of Charlie Kaufman. All I can think of like now at the minute is like because it's like 1994. You said so now. Mm-hmm. All I can think of is okay. So like, what else is also extant in this universe? Like, mm-hmm. have, did Eugene see Jurassic Park? Is that something that that we ever <laughs> find out about? Because if so, I feel I feel there should be an episode about him maybe trying to uh, explain dinosaurs to the... Mm. Or or starting (laughs) a Jurassic Park in Odyssey. Yeah. One of the weird things about Odyssey is that adults don't watch movies. Like, you'll you'll often hear about kids going and seeing the latest movie. That's a good point. Yeah, they talk about Star Wars at one point. But, like, that is not something grown-ups do. Yeah, grown-ups will, like, drop their kids off at the movie theater, but they'll never see a movie themselves. That's definitely interesting, which actually brings me around to, like, one of of the questions that I Mm. had while I was listening Mm. to this, which is, what is the audience for this show? Who is it Mm. that's listening to? Like, who is it aimed at? (laughs) I would love to tell you that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Is, uh, basically, the core audience is children, right? It's kind of like ages, I would say, 6 to 12. The mm-hmm. idea is that kids who are Christian can listen to this on the radio. You know, they would air this on in weekly syndication on Christian radio stations around the country. And so... And in the UK. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah. Canada. And um, by listening... To these uh, radio episodes, children could learn these lessons, you know, and and also sort of become early customers in a way like it's actually a customer acquisition play on some level for focus on the family, the organization that makes these because Mm. it Mm. raises brand awareness among kids for this org and causes them to associate focus on the family with positive memories. Oh, I remember Adventures in Odyssey. It was so nice. Yeah. The thing is, you grow a little bit older and you realize it's the same organization that's funding anti-gay marriage proposals and stuff like that. But if you are uh, if you see it as a warm, fuzzy thing, you might not realize there are extreme opinions. And instead, you're sort of going to be inculcated into this sort of way of thinking about social issues. So it's an early step along the radicalization pipeline, actually. Um, mm. And it's also an opportunity for parents to buy the tapes, buy yeah. the CDs, and play them on road trips to pacify your shitty fucking kids. And especially for parents who don't want their kids watching contemporary movies or TV. Right. Right. Mm. Here's an alternative okay. that's being made by good Christians that also doesn't use uh, evil screens or anything like that. <laughs> Theater of the imagination. Right. Uh, yeah. In order to play out its things, which is somehow more insidious because then they become more personal to you. Right. right. Because you make up what they look like and how they act, how they move, how they talk in your, basically your mind. Yeah. And everyone in Odyssey has my face. <laughs> <laughs> oh. but does that uh, track with your impulse, Phoebe? Or I, I'm curious what you what are your thoughts? on? Yeah, that? Well, I mean, like it's like I, I definitely didn't think it was aimed at adults because like it is not like it's not especially complicated should right, we say no, sure. it's no. yeah. storytelling and it's and it and it feels and it feels very like kind of moralistic and didactic which is presumably a kind of fairly stupid point because like 
of like of course it does because that's what it's sort of aimed to be but like right. it, it it feels like it's aimed at children but i think the reason that um i was wondering who it actually is supposed to be aimed at is because there aren't any children in it or certainly there aren't mm-hmm. any children in mm-hmm. the episodes that i listen to and the way that you get kids interested in something is you either make it about other children or or critters like i can't like mm-hmm. i can't imagine mm. what i can't imagine what a child is getting out of like the <laughs> is getting out of the uh kind of grouchy musings of a window washer um yeah, like not, that yeah. The, not that there's anything wrong not that there's anything wrong with the with the profession of window washing <laughs> yeah, well, how that? that's real classist of you phoebe actually it's, it's, uh, it's very interestingly non-aspirational and it's yeah. very mm, interestingly yeah. Yeah. not about uh not about the kind of inherent intrinsic value of of rich people which is something which i which i super associate with mm-hmm. american evangelism like this like like this like idea that like if you are rich, it's because God has made you rich. Like there's very there's right. very little kind of rich man through the eye of the needle in American evangelism. And so I thought what so mm. something I found interesting was it being centered around, or certainly these episodes being centered around yeah. this guy who has this very very mm. ordinary blue collar job. These episodes are kind of outliers in that regard. Oh, oh, oh okay, fine, uh, interesting. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, are, there children, because- are there children in it elsewhere? There, uh, I mean, there uh, are the children. Place, yeah. But uh, the show will increasingly focus on adults uh, from this point on. But also the the main character of the show was an elderly rich man. And then the actor who played the elderly rich man died. Uh, right, so okay. this is this is part of why this 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 road trip is happening. But, yeah, he usually is the focus. It's this guy who used to be uh, in, the, okay. in in intelligence agencies and owns an encyclopedia company and an ice cream shop and all of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But again, this is a what? show aimed at kids that once <laughs> did. Yeah. This is a show that is aimed at kids that once did an entire episode on eminent domain. And like, yeah. <laughs> like, like in, and not in a way that's like, oh, let's make this fun for kids. But like in no. a very dry, I will explain to you the legal definition of this and how, why like, this man's house like is getting taken. highway is going to go through this guy's farmland property until we find out that there is an area of historical significance that's going to get in the way and create a lot more red tape for that highway to be constructed. This is for six-year-olds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's never too early to learn about red tape. That's never too early. No, that's what early. I'm saying. And it's yeah. very important yeah. as well to encourage kids to, you know, oppose bureaucratic red tape and ensure that society's prime movers are allowed to do whatever they want without the interference yeah. of the government. Look, I think I think if we know if we learn anything from the story of Jesus is that bureaucrats are not ideal and you mm, want to keep away yeah. from them if you, mm. if you possibly can. Mm-hmm. I, I do also think that this depiction of Bernard as blue collar working class is also more affectation than anything. They call mm. him a janitor, but he is a business owner, right? He does plumbing. He does clean up work. He does maintenance. He replaces windows. This guy's actually rolling in it. He's okay. just also a cheapskate. Yeah, he's okay, sort of so in the... So he's a kind of petty, like he's a kind of petty bourgeois authenticrat. He's a small yeah, business yeah. tyrant. Yeah, he's sort of like in the same category as auto dealers, right? Yeah. Where he actually right, has a okay. very successful local small business. But he just like is like, well, I just I'm just a simple window washer and I don't know about my squeegee, things of that nature. And that also is presumably why he has enough cash to keep paying for shit along this yeah. trip, because <laughs> what we're going to find as these episodes proceed is that he keeps getting into trouble because of this broken down car and he has to keep spending mm-hmm. money uh, to make things happen. So Bernard's truck actually breaks down on mm-hmm. the road. Eugene in the bus passes right by Bernard. And even though they're on the highway and this scene takes place (laughs) over the course of like two minutes is like, Hey, stop the bus. I need to get off and talk to my friend. There's a nice little sort of Simpsons joke where he says, I have to go. And everybody's like, yeah, I I actually, I did genuinely (laughs) laugh at that. I thought that was great. Eugene ends up getting off the bus. He takes a bag with him that he thinks is his own bag. Mm-mm. Keep that one in your head. And uh, Bernard and Eugene have to hoof it 13 miles to get to the next town. Hitchhiking is a dangerous business in the best of times. Perhaps I should hold my sign higher. I think it's more than that, Eugene. It is? Most people use phrases like stop, need help, 
Well, yes, but that seems so unfriendly, so demanding. Right. So you wrote, uh, now let me see if I can get this phrasing right. Please cease your driving. Assistance required. Thank you. I think it states the matter clearly without undue coercion. I, I really like that Eugene is worried about being too coercive. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, to be fair, he lives in a town of extremely fucking coercive people, so I can <laughs> understand that. I want to talk a little bit about Eugene and Bernard's dynamic, because I think it sure. is worth sort of getting into. I think they are sort of a very good odd couple. Like, if you were going to pair two people together, I think this is a g- interesting combination. It yeah. is. In- I think I think what's more interesting is that Connie is not here in any regard mm-hmm. because she was really the flagship character of the show for so so long and she seems to have just been embedded entirely for dudes being dudes yeah we're 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 in cousin territory here that's something that gets only a passing mention here that that Eugene and Bernard are actually related to each other yeah um but this is yeah th- in the same way that they did do an odd couple episode with with Eugene and Bernard that we haven't listened to on this show now we're into Bob and Bing territory, right? This is yeah. the road to San Diego. Yeah. Um, without any musical numbers, unfortunately. Uh, and I can't we believe get the, they haven't done a musical episode yet. I mean, they It's been have, like 30 years. They have done musical episodes, but not in not in maybe the way that you would think. Not in the way that you would think. What way is it? <laughs> Well, it's like, a you know, there's a third way. <laughs> well, it's, it's not, it's, way. you know, it's not like here's the musical episode of Adventures in Odyssey the way that there's a musical episode of, say, Scrubs or something like that. It's like uh, here's a Christmas caroling episode, you know, uh, where okay, okay. Will Ryan um, you know, or, or some of their live shows are kind of done as variety shows. And yeah, it's more Prairie Home Companion than, say, yeah, a musical yeah musical. actually, that's, yeah. A, that's a great way of putting it. Uh, and Garrison Keillor shows up and he sexually harasses everybody. Uh, and then Chris Thiele replaces him and everyone stops listening. So uh, <laughs> uh, we get a classic, you know, how could this get any worse? It immediately starts raining. Yep. Bit. And this show weirdly then gets into this mode of trying to suck off truck drivers. Yeah, now, I'm telling you, Eugene, my faith in humanity is restored. Truck drivers are some of the best people in the world. He seemed quite nice. Nice. Not only did he stop for us, but he towed the pickup back. And he did it all in the pouring rain. Now, that's not nice, Eugene. That's downright Christian. <laughs> what the fuck? Your thoughts, Phoebe. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, that's a really odd thing to kind of land on there as being like, you know what? I feel like there's a possibility that we haven't made this sh- we haven't made this episode like sufficiently trucker friendly. So can we, <laughs> could we maybe could we maybe have a shout out to the truckers? Um, James, to, the, yeah. <laughs> to the to the to the to the real heads. Could we maybe just maybe just say something nice about 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 them because i feel like if we've got a lot of truck we've got a lot of truckers who listen who listen to the show and that they've been writing in and they've been yeah. saying <laughs> james james dobson bursts through the doors of focus on the family saying these truckers they're after me you have to get them off my back you know they the keep f- honking their horns outside my house at 3 a.m the funny what thing is this that's not what Hello, dobson sounds me, like james but i'll take dobson, it founder of focus on the family <laughs> The funny thing, though, Phoebe, is that that's actually probably kind of true that yeah. like the, the, an audio Amazing. drama is going to and focus in general has a following among drivers, right? Truck drivers, mm-hmm. because what do you do when you're on the road for a long time? You listen to audio, you listen to books on tape, you listen to yeah. audio dramas, you listen to focus Rush on the Limbaugh. family, which is James Dobson's flagship radio program. Yeah. I do think that this is actually sucking off their audience a little bit. It's kind mm-hmm. of like how in sporting events. Uh, in America, there's like something weird to suck off the troops in every single fucking like it. You go to the Mets and in the sixth inning, they're like, and here's today's veteran of the game. And it's like, I f- fuck you. I don't care. Wouldn't a veteran of the game just be someone who like experienced the game? <laughs> like, it just flashes like a random member of the crowd. I'm a veteran it's just, of like, many this Mets is games. <laughs> Hi. But like. Truck drivers are so, like, mythologized, too, in America, right? Like, C.W. McCall had that huge hit with Convoy in the 70s, which these guys are still kind of living in in 1994. Do, do lorry drivers have any of that same sort of... Like, we hold them up in, in the U.S. as, like, the modern-day cowboys. Is is oh. there any kind of love for lorry drivers in that same way in the U.K.? No, I don't... 
I don't think so. That there's a. <laughs> that, uh, is a gen- Sorry, this is ge- this is gen- this is genuinely taken me aback. I don't think I've ever <laughs> c- I've ever considered I've ever considered this question. There was definitely that. There's definitely been uh, a little bit of hoo ha recently over lorry drivers and gigantic uh, gigantic queues since since Brexit. Oh sure, um, with yeah. The kind of delivering delivery sex drivers horses. being yeah. kind of held up. Yeah, exactly. Being held up by lots and lots of red tape and so on and so forth. I remember there being like some very, very short lived attempt to uh, try and get rid of um, king size Rizzlers because some. Sorry, what? Oh, I'm sorry, a (laughs) Rizzler? Yeah, a Rizzler. I, Is that a Batman villain? Were... <laughs> yeah, it's like the Gen Z Riddler, but yeah, he just well, has it, a lot of Riz. It's Baby yeah, Rock. He's, it's Baby yeah, Rock. He's he Rizzed Baby Rock, Livy up. He's yes. the Rizzler. Yeah. I genuinely don't know what they're called in America. Cigarette papers. Oh, okay. Oh, rolling, 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 papers. Yeah, rolling papers. Yeah, rolling papers. Rolling papers. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Well, here we call yeah. them Rizzlers because that is the okay. Okay. that is the brand name, and you can get the and you and you can get the king you can get the king size Rizzlers. And okay. they are for smoking wheat. That's like that's that that's all that's mm. all they're for. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And Great. the and the argument of the company was no 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 we have to keep issuing them because long distance lorry drivers don't get that many cigarette breaks. So when they do, they mm. want to have like mm. a really really long cigarette. And so that's why we have <laughs> to keep making king size uh-huh. Rizzlers. Okay, okay. And this is like, that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of thing that makes long distance lorry drivers uh, kind of uh, appear in the collective British imagination. Oh, I, that's, yeah. like, that's fascinating. That's, that's what we've got. We've got, we've got the Eddie Stobart lorries, which are, they have, they, they have a rule where like their drivers are meant to wave at you if you wave at them. Um, what? So like technically, like they have to, they have to, yeah. <laughs> you can. If a, you see them Eddie's, trying to drive, and they slowly like contort their bodies like, and start waving. Uh, yeah, if a if an Eddie Stobart driver fails to return your wave or salute, I think technically you can report them. Oh, to, those guys need a union. That's Stobart. not called at the headquarters. They, no, yeah. they, these, wow. these, these motherfuckers need a union. Forehead. Like nothing. Like <laughs> like no one else on earth. But no, I don't. There's there's definitely there's definitely no, or certainly not so far as I'm aware of. There's no kind of like romanticization mm. of 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 the lorry driver or or like the idea. Of, I love the idea of them being like. Like, dro- like kind of being stuck up for and just being like, I'm a cowboy. Like, no, you're not. You're stuck on the M4 just <laughs> yeah. like the well, this, this all comes back to yeah. the development of the interstate highway system in the 1950s and the gutting of rail infrastructure, which was not a decision yeah, that right, was made in the UK. So there you go. Yeah, Eugene almost got to that point. Well, and the other thing is, too, we're just far less dense, right? Especially right. once you get west of the Mississippi River. Mm-hmm. Everything's really spread out. So you're crossing the wild, untamed desert frontier just like the cowboys did with all of the cows. That's that's true. And, yeah. you know, and they get mythologized in Canada in the same way, like the fucking con, the anti-vax oh convoy and, you know, oh, yeah, all that yeah. shit. And we'll get a little a circle, further yeah. west in a bit. But yes, for the time being, we are still in presumably Ohio, wherever yeah, it is that generally. Odyssey is. So Bernard and Eugene have gotten picked up by this trucker. Back in the day, sure, I would indulge hell. I wouldn't let you turn me into Swiss cheese. <laughs> I wouldn't let you make me a. Make me into a mailbox. Just open the slot and put whatever you want inside. Uh, not no that. more. I got a wife now, so I will not suck you and I will not be sucked on by you. And, uh, you know, they're at a nearby diner and Eugene orders the train wreck special, which is made of a steer that got hit by a train. Wah, wah, wah. Good joke. Uh, I like good it. little joke. But yeah, basically, Bernard moves back on again. Eugene gets ready to catch another bus. But... As he's about to get back on board the bus, Eugene is accused of theft because apparently he took the wrong bag. (gasps) They didn't know how to fill time here, so they just kept adding plots. (laughs) Right. I can assure you, you're positive it's yours? Yes. Well, actually, I haven't looked at it since uh, 
I got off the bus. Empty it out, please. Of course. There should be my laptop computer. That's, that's a wonderful line reading. Uh, like, oh, I, I know I know we're supposed to be saying it, Bernard. I'm sorry, I can't say that. His name is Bernard, and that, that's just what I... You can call him Bernard. I, what, that's that's what fine. Yeah, please, please. He's the lead singer of New Order. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. James Dobson, huge New Order fan. Yeah, not a lot of people know that. Not a lot of people know that. Um, he's, He is... Yeah. He's tremendously <laughs> ungrateful for Eugene getting off the bus to help him out with his yeah. truck. Yeah. He behaves like this is a kind of huge imposition. And again, I thought they were going to do they were going to go down a, you know, Jesus says you must you must love you must love your neighbor. Um, right. and mm-hmm. like maybe kind of making a point about like being like you know, sort of showing gratitude and kind of getting such gifts as such gifts as you are offered. But no, again, that does I was again just bang wrong the point does seem to be <laughs> that him getting off this bus when there's not going to be another bus for like another day um is genuinely an imposition <laughs> that he has placed that he has placed on bernard and it's not and it's like a really really weird thing of him to have done and he's kind of adding mm-hmm. a bunch of he's adding a bunch of different issues to bernard's already kind of issue issue riddled day which I think is which I think is really really odd. Like they they really seem to be kind of like pushing the kind of the, you know what? I know there's this whole thing about how like, if you don't really care for somebody's vibe, you still gotta love them because you know we are all the children mm-hmm. we are all the children of Christ. No, that's not that's that doesn't seem <laughs> to be the vibe of the show at all. The vibe seems to be like if someone irritates you just a little bit. You can be as much of a dick to them as you like. And no yeah. one no yeah. one will ever judge you for this. But what they will judge you for is having an experience just for the sake of having an experience. And I'm not I'm sure this is yeah. not right. <laughs> yeah. I'm so sure that this is not the right the right takeaway from yeah, this it's, episode. No, it's, just, it's genuinely it's genuinely mean spirited. They will always go for the joke, uh, no matter what. Like if if a kid, if if there's a kid centric plot line and the kids being mean that might get called out, but even then, they're still going for just sort of sitcom humor, which is often just going for the insult. Mm. Mm-hmm. And here it's no different, and here it's not called out, and it's not really noted as sinful, and it breeds rude little Christian children. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. Like well, I mean, me. it's, like, <laughs> well, it's like it's like if you are annoying, it teaches you the lesson that if you are annoying, you are a burden on all those around yeah. you. And maybe that's yeah. just my Catholicism talking, but like it's. <laughs> It's it's really potent in this. And but the nice I, thing about Catholicism yeah. is that if you're a burden on everyone, that's a blessing for them. Mm. Mm. Like you're mm. you're bringing Christ's suffering to them. You are right, the cross right, for them right. to bear. I think it's also very interesting that in this scene, the woman that is accusing him of stealing the rucksack is just from New York yeah. for some reason. Like it's got this very sort of and I don't. I think I I mean is it just another commentary on like people from the cities being these like insufferable I don't awful think it's people. that deep I, don't think, I, I think don't it's think liter- that that's I think it's- what they're saying at all actually I think that New York I think that New York is supposed to be is supposed to be a dog whistle for his audience actually I think that's what it's supposed to be I think you're supposed to think that she is a right, 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 right. she okay. is a kind yeah. of busybody Jewish lady with her with her cashmere jumper. This is I don't think this is an intentional bit of anti-Semitism necessarily. Like I don't think that they know fully what it is that they're doing. It's just that mm. these are stereotypes yeah. that are so baked into their understanding of the world that because we this it happens on the show time yeah. and time again. This is a good example of hitting on a stereotype or an other without intentionally yeah, doing no, I don't, so. I don't, like I don't think it's supposed to be like de- like kind of deliberately but I think that there's like I think it's there's definitely this kind of like kind of atmospheric suspicion of kind of big city behavior and it always feels to me that that does that just that has a kind of coding to it kind of mm-hmm. sort of like yeah. sort of regardless yep. you know real, real kind of like real kind of like Jack just say Jewish this is taking forever um like yes. that, that. So it, again, like I, th- I think it's like one of those things. that's like so atmospheric. It's not even necessarily uh, deliberate or conscious. But then again, it's not. It's probably not deliberate or conscious that Eugene has a kind of nebbishy Woody Allen style yeah. of mm-hmm. delivery, mm-hmm. and you are supposed mm-hmm. to think that he is not quite right for this town. He represents. 
he represents yep. a kind of an like a kind of an other as well and i don't think that's deliberate at all but it's just like it's just there it's there in the kind of the like the unconscious formation yeah. of the characters and the stories and we encounter another example of this in this episode because eugene ends up at a hotel where there's a plumber's convention going on upstairs james dobson bursts through the door we got to get the plumbers in i'm getting all these freaking letters from these plumbers and they 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 are rizzed up on those rizzlers and and your depiction of james dobson aj is very queenie just as pardon me yes may i help you i'm looking for the plumbers meeting ah a late arrival they're in the skylight lounge for their traditional opening sing-along time just listen for the 10th chorus of tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree. You can't miss them. <laughs> this is the Cabana Boy from The Curse of Monkey Island. I, don't, yes. I can't really wrap my head around it. Other well, than- they've done it before. Like, like, really faggy receptionists are a staple of this show. And mm. it's not like they realize that that's what they're doing. because They don't know what gay people actually sound like. Well, is that like a, is that like a kind of a... Okay, well, we want a bit of like we want a little bit of diversity in the in the show. Like, what kind of jobs do gay people do? I don't know, hotel receptionist. Like, that's like that feels like a pretty gay job to have. Like, what is what's the? I think it's I think it's really just like they have fifties TV running through their heads, and so you'd have these like character actors who would just like play a receptionist at a hotel. And what's a way to make that character funny immediately? Oh, they're just very effeminate. And they say certain words too long or too too high, you know. It's just yeah, that, it, yes, mm-hmm. is such uh, like a trope. Mm. It's on The Simpsons too. Mm-hmm. It's it's influenced sort of by the Charles Nelson Rileys and Paul mm-hmm. Lynns of the world. Where it, did they even clock that those guys are gay? Hard to say because they don't really want to acknowledge that homosexuality exists. And to the extent yeah. that they do acknowledge it, it's as an abomination. They don't yeah. talk about being gay explicitly on the show. Pretty much ever, Um, although in later seasons, like much more recently, uh, there is some talk of alternative lifestyles and right. Well, and then the only like gay character that is acknowledged as gay that comes across the the screen, as it were, is in the hospital dying of AIDS. Uh, So (laughs) what? No. Wait. Wait. No, <laughs> so no, for them, no. the stereotype yeah. of a gay character is, you know, you hear uh, an EKG in the background and a respirator and everything else. Oh, God. Wait, I thought I thought there was a roving group of homosexuals who are like graffitiing places. Yeah, you don't meet them. It's very confusing. They just get graffitied one day and they're like, oh, yeah, that's the roving group of homosexuals that does that. Yeah, this is this is not Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. You don't get to actually meet them. It's just a gang of receptionists. (laughs) Spray painting gays. How how dare you remind me of that plot point from Studio 60. Exactly. (laughs) Anyway, at the hotel, there is sort of a nice little reunion here right bernard Mm. sees eugene he says how does it feel to treat me like you do that's actually what the plumbers are singing upstairs as they're exploring each (laughs) other's bodies blue monday you know wouldn't (laughs) you know it bernard actually did want to come back for eugene and it's all very nice there's a, a an officer who's like oh this guy was looking all over for you well surprise bernard secretly has a heart of gold he cares that's the end of the episode. The moral of the story, I guess, is be really annoying and eventually somebody will have to put up with you. Like then at the then at the end when when we have the kind of the summing up of the moral of the of the episode, like using the scripture. Yes. And like at first I was like, I feel like this is maybe a little bit on the nose to have this kind of summary. But since I got what the moral of the episode was supposed to be so badly wrong i actually kind of appreciated the woman at the end being like okay so here is what this is supposed to teach i'm like i did not get that thank you thank you very much and she says essentially that it is sinful to want experience just for its own sake which is a <laughs> fully deranged reading of biblical scripture yeah, like, yeah. What? right Come on. there is a lesson you can draw from this and, and like like you said phoebe like you found multiple that's like oh yeah there is something more valuable to be found in like appreciating the people around you being good to them etc and it's just like you know what you know who was wrong in this story <laughs> just eugene yes. the fucking godless autist loser 
decided that he wanted to have an experience. Well, he did, and it almost got him arrested. And that'll happen to you too, <laughs> yeah. kids. You'll be sucking cocks in hell. <laughs> and also to Bernard, two episodes later, don't worry about it. Like, I mean, th- this sort of whiplash will happen in every single one of the episodes that we listen to, where the episode seems to be going one way, and then in the epilogue, Chris tells us something completely (laughs) fucking different. So just bear that in mind as well as we go into this next episode here. Episode 275, Second Thoughts. See, get it? First-hand experience, Mm -hmm. Second Mm -hmm. Thoughts. See what they did there? Um, This episode starts off with additional goofy-ass music uh, because Eugene is on the road with Bernard and, uh, you know, reading every sign out loud. This episode is written by Marshall Younger, who Mm. was first brought in to be sort of the dramaturg for Adventures in Odyssey. Yeah, he's the lore guy, right? Yeah, he was the guy who made the show Bible, which I'm surprised they were allowed to call it that. (laughs) Yep. And (laughs) the living show Bible. And got rid of a lot of their continuity (laughs) problems, yeah. So we're in Iowa and uh, Eugene's computer has broken. So he has nothing to do other than read signs the as they drive kind of past. What battery life did he have? I, like, I, <laughs> well, maybe he had one of those adapters that plugged into the thing to, I don't oh, know. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, they end up running into a, well, almost running into a deer. And Bernard, at the very last moment, swerves away from the deer and runs into a historical marker. Yeah, the the Donald Wood historical marker. He died in 1986. Yeah, so he's freshly dead. And this matters for reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Like, you know, they, they get approached by uh, obviously the, the repair guy who is the main right. sort of character of, of this particular story. But like, I feel like the repair guy released the deer to get more business. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, because it's 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 oddly convenient timing. Everything yeah. about this is the setup for a folk horror movie. This is mm-hmm. so yeah. literally what I was about to say in the exact <laughs> the exact wording this is fucking ariasta ass shit that is happening here like oh what oh what there's this guy there's this like rural mechanic who like seems to have a kind of endless supply of deer that he's just kind of like releasing and like oh what what's that what's that weird doll he has in his barn don't worry about it don't look at the doll like, that, that was that was what i thought they were gonna go with i love all your fake severed heads yes yeah, fake fake, fake. <laughs> they go along with this guy because obviously they've never seen an ari Aster movie because ari Aster wasn't making movies in 1994. So this man's name is Kyle, uh, and he has a son named Graham. On meeting Graham, the kid, uh, Eugene immediately starts fucking flexing on him (laughs) about how much bigger Odyssey is than this fucking podunk town that they live in. No, 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 it's very, very sweet. And then the kid's like, do you want to come in the back and like look at our look at our collection of wax figures? Don't look at the eyes. Don't look at the eyes. They're not nothing's happening with the eyes. (laughs) Do you want to see all of our costumes made out of animal skins? (laughs) (laughs) Do you want to just try on this headdress that we've got here just to see if it fits? Just to see if it just to see if it fits. Just to see if it fits. But basically, Bernard gets quoted five to six days of work. Now Bernard and Eugene are just going to have to be in this town in Iowa for five to six days, which is Mm -hmm. okay because there's a fair going on in town named for Uh this guy, Donald Wood. I feel I have a somewhat extensive knowledge of American history, and yet I've never heard of Donald Wood. Who is he? You don't know Donald Wood? No. Donald Wood put this town on the map. As a matter of fact, after he died, we renamed the city after him. Oh, yeah. We owe a lot to Donald. (laughs) uh, What did he do? Why, he invented graphite handle pruning shears. Revolutionized pruning. I've, it'll never be the same. Oh. Did you tell him about the fair, Kyle? Oh, oh, yeah. We've also renamed the county fair after him. It's this weekend. You should be here for that. The, it's, the, the dread is building. Mm. Everything is setting us up for a Shirley Jackson situation to go down at this fair. Yeah, you yep. sure better yep. stick around for our, for our <laughs> midsummer festival. <laughs> You know, normal midsummer <laughs> festival we've got here. Surely they must have been aware in writing this that they were clearly setting up a horror premise, right? They did, they, no. which they completely failed to deliver I, on. I don't yeah. think so because there are a couple episodes of like people getting like the Barclays getting stranded in small towns and then going to like a church barbecue that ends up being a lot of fun. Mm. I, I think they just think that this is how wholesome small towns are. 
But sure. then they hired Charles Knox Robinson, who does this fucking terrifying performance as Kyle Barnett. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Like everything so is so menace. gravelly. Yeah. yeah. It's, he's, it's, it's, he's just like, you know, every year at the fair, the fattest pig wins. <laughs> <laughs> How much do you say you weigh? Yeah. Another thing that's Have going on potatoes. here yeah. is that <laughs> Kyle is sort of grooming his kid Graham to be the successor to his yeah. auto mechanic shop fortune in a town auto mechanic of, shop slash pig farm in his town yeah. of 60 people and Graham's not about it right he's got yeah. big city dreams so Graham this is one of the the only a couple of sort of big name actors I mean Charles Knox Robinson we've talked about him on the show before Graham yeah. is played by Christopher Castile who mm, will okay. actually recur on a, a uh, on adventures in Odyssey uh, we're going to see him again very soon as Zachary. And then after his voice changes, he comes back to play Nick Mulligan. He was in the first two Beethoven movies. Hi. Ah. And he the he's dog? the little blonde kid. No, <laughs> he's the little blonde kid with the glasses. Uh, and he was also a regular. He was also main cast on Step by Step for the seven years that it ran. And he was in nine episodes of Hey Arnold as Eugene Horowitz. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Christopher Castile is no longer an actor. He teaches at, Josh, you're going to love this, mm. Biola. Oh, I do love this. <laughs> <laughs> Biola is the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Oh. Brian, you have been mentioning the Kyle and Graham relationship. Yeah. And the way that Kyle just comes across as super menacing when he's trying to tell his kid, you know, how to behave. And we've got a great clip of that here. Graham? Yeah? I, uh, I just went down to the barn. You didn't wash Woody today. Oh, yeah. I forgot. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, I took the fair very seriously. (laughs) The week of the fair, I spent every waking moment getting that pig ready. And you know why? Because it's not just a contest. The fair is big business. It's a sacrifice to the, the gods of Iowa. Can auction off as much as <laughs> the old gods. Dollars. That's a lot of money. The ones uh-huh. whose names we have yet forgotten. <laughs> Competing in the fair taught me important things like, like responsibility and the discipline of farm life. Yes, sir. And the importance the value of sacrifice. Blood. Graham, <laughs> Human I thought blood. we agreed when I got you this computer that it came second behind your chores on the farm. I did all my regular chores. Yeah, I'm not talking about your regular chores. I'm talking about getting ready for the fair. <laughs> We're Jesus. counting on it. <laughs> what you got the best pig about? out there. Now, come on. Well, can I just finish up this program? The computer will wait. The fair is this weekend. This is like 15 out of the 22 minutes of this episode. Yeah. It's just some hemming and hawing <laughs> yep. about the pig. About the pig. It is some pig. Yeah, the other half is, you know, the kid wanting to go to San Diego, which he's like, I can go to Disneyland. I'm like, oh, buddy, <laughs> Disneyland is not in San Diego. Disneyland is in Orange fucking County. He tries yeah. he tries to get Eugene to take him along. And it's like, Eugene's like, well, that would be federal kidnapping. Yeah. So yeah, I no. don't like how he whispers to us specifically a federal offense. I don't like when Eugene <laughs> talks to me. I feel like Kyle is maybe... Yeah, like 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 you said, I think he's maybe worshiping the old gods. I think he might have mm-hmm. some weird pig costume mm. that's sort of going on. <laughs> that's kind of going on back there. Do you know A what mask. it ma- You know what it makes me think of? Yeah. There is an episode of the X Files which is to this day one of the scariest bits of television I've ever seen in my entire life. It was really unfortunate. I saw it when I was about 10 and we were staying in a kind of rural holiday cottage in the middle of nowhere. And I am not from the countryside. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm from London. I need lots and lots of street noise around me at all times right. to feel even remotely safe. And like all there was out here was like kind of a bit like a bit of tree sort of noise and like that's basically it. Like silence, <laughs> yeah, silence, yeah, yeah. silence. <laughs> and this episode of the X Files is about this tiny little town. They're they're all really, really old, but they're really young looking. And then they all start dying of mad cow disease. And they're trying to work out why everyone in this town is dying of mad cow disease. And it turns out it's that they have worked out a way of uh, of getting eternal youth through cannibalism. And this mm. involves mm-hmm. these rituals to a kind of chicken god. I'm not making this up. Um, like... Uh, who's like who's just like one of like the local lads who dresses up in this like kind of very very unnerving chicken costume and there's a bit when they find like the heads 
in a cupboard because like you can't eat the heads but it but this is why mm-hmm. everyone in the town is dying from bse and this is kind of what i feel like is going on maybe with kyle i think he's maybe he's maybe a pig god um he's trying oh, to he is the pig god he's the he's yeah. the pig god he's try like it's oh, um like it's a hereditary uh it's a hereditary system it's quite egalitarian mm. like that like mm. like that i suppose um uh, if 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 you if you die with no children, then I think you uh, I think they have an election to to pick the next <laughs> pig god, and he wants Graham, mm. little Graham, to be the next pig god, but he's more interested in the false god of the computer, as is again as is my yeah. understanding. There's a great line that uh, Graham has in this where he says, "In San Diego, everything is computers." <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> no, there's oh, well, a. I, there, I, don't, there's, I don't know. There, I, there's I, I'm a, deferring to your expertise, uh, AJ. AJ was right to snap at you. See, there's a thing. There's <laughs> a thing that like your place. <laughs> there is there is a pyramid in San Diego that's a Fry's Electronics, or it was for it's, a really yeah. long time. Yeah, true. Yeah, and rip. it's just a like if you're driving through Miramar, which is where Top Gun is set, there is just in the middle of like these empty fields, you just see this glass pyramid, this <laughs> monument to fucking nothing, sitting in the middle of the field and it was and I to this day have never been because it has scared me too much you never will because fries is gone now because that's where we get that's where uh, San Diegans actually elect their pig god (laughs) in the the fries fries pyramid yeah yeah so the fries pyramid is gone the steel case pyramid is gone I mean I mean abandoned the pyramids are still there because they sit on the ley lines to protect the bass pro 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 shop in Memphis (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> it's the last bastion of pig god in this country. So um, I apologize for how aggressively American this is. I, I promised <laughs> that we weren't going to do the bit where we shoot off all of our guns. Uh, but now I don't know. We might have to this do it. This kind of grew out of my head. Yep. Got so, burgers coming. There's a lot of back and forth here. As, as Brian was saying, it's like 16 of these 22 minutes are just going back and forth yeah. about, but I want the computer, but you got to have the pig, but I want the computer. And so Graham takes the pig. He tries to drive out of town with the pig to sell yeah. it. That doesn't work out. And uh, Graham's a little thief. Eugene's. I'm just saying that. I'm just, yeah. Yeah. just yeah. flagging that up. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know what kind, really of, what, what, what kind of morals Carl has been instilling in his junior pig god but like i'm not happy i'm not happy with <laughs> yeah, uh, no. with the obvious with the route that he that he goes i actually do have a question before you before you say the next thing i'm sure. really sorry mm-hmm. for interrupting um Please so don't. so this is 1994 right i'm yeah. assuming mm-hmm. that the uh that the understanding of what it is possible for a kind of home computer to do and what it is possible for like a smallish child to do on said home computer is like sketchy at best it's like kind of imprecise it kind of feels i'm, I'm sorry to bring up jurassic park again but it does feel a little bit like you know <laughs> like when she's, it's yeah. Unix system. Yeah. I know she's this. just like yeah it's a yeah. unix system i'm a, like i'm a hacker and it's like no, you're, yep. you're like nine years old. Like, what are you talking about? You are you are you are simply not a hacker. What are you talking about? Um, and like, I'm I'm assuming that they're not going to kind of go down a full kind of like hackers route with you know one of those like kind of acoustic couple things and the kind of the recorded modem beeps yeah. in order to like get onto the get onto a network like through a kind of phone box or whatever <laughs> it is. But do they ever explain? How this child in this fucking horrifying deliverance style (laughs) farm in the middle of nowhere has not just a computer, but in 1994, but has has assembled for himself in a non networked time, this kind of. Uh, kind of sophisticated understanding of how to use said computer. Is that something that they are at all interested in? in dealing with or are they just like oh well he's a kid kids like computers the computers in odyssey are oftentimes just used when the writers don't really know how to solve something through mechanics and so (laughs) they point to the computer instead and they say hey it's a computer it can do anything it's magic because (laughs) that's exactly what happens here right yeah yeah this is literally um, that the computer can do anything like as far as i can tell he uses the internet which is which does not exist in in the in the manner in which he claims it does uh not in the middle of iowa certainly (laughs) yeah no (laughs) in the middle of iowa because eugene helps graham come up with a software program that serves as a comprehensive directory of every single automobile part available everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's like an always updated, 
yeah, online repository where you can just search for any kind of thing. Let's say a brake pad and it'll show you every pet boys in Iowa that has brake pads and exclude all the pet boys in Iowa that don't have brake pads. Now, Kyle understands that, oh, wow, my kid can do things with the computer that can also help my business. This is so good. I now love and respect my kid because he made me more money. Exactly. And uh, has value to me. They go off to the fair after this and Kyle discovers that Graham likes baseball cards. And it's like, oh, wow, I like baseball cards. And somehow he didn't know this before. It's just the, the, it's so <laughs> weird. Like they two, hand two wave. other visitors end up in town. So Eugene and Bernard don't have to be skinned. They get to skin uh, different <laughs> they, people. They, yeah, they get to go to the pig watch, which yeah. Eugene says, I love a good pig watch. <laughs> Who doesn't love a good pig watch? And, uh, you know, it, to, to the point of how, like, they just don't know how to fucking end these episodes. Um, we've gotten now this arc where the kid, I guess, is now happy with his circumstances, sort of, or at least he has been able to take his special interest and, uh, subvert it to the whims of his father. And Chris, at the end of this episode, basically just says that your circumstances are fully God's will. So suck it up, asshole. (laughs) That's it. Yay. Yeah, that's the episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's it. I mean, like, how they talk him out of it is quite fun when they explain to him that, oh, well, you're like a nine year old kid. So, like, here's the stuff that you have to kind of pay for for yourself as an adult. You have to find, like, somewhere to rent. You probably have to get a job as a dishwasher. And, and Graham, because he's a, horrible little thief doesn't want to work, and doesn't want to and doesn't want to work hard as is demonstrated by his refusal to do his uh to do his uh, godly pig preparation yeah nobody wants to work no anymore. he doesn't want he doesn't, he doesn't he doesn't want to work and so he sort of takes a line like oh i hadn't really realized that i'd be expected to look after myself if i went to san diego it's like i feel like there are more barriers to a nine-year-old farm boy showing up in san diego and being like i'm gonna do computers now than than just a case of like how's this kid gonna pay, pay rent there is like that's so far down the list of things that you need to be thinking <laughs> about before you're wondering about what job he's gonna do um and yeah and like the and the moral seems to be like suck it up princess which i think is 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 interesting scripturally yeah <laughs> and it's 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 super toxic honestly i mean we, we we talk a fair bit about the toxicity of the morals that this show instills in kids and this is an incredibly toxic thing to say mm. you know i there there's there's definitely i think value in being like hey, make the best of whatever your circumstances are. Sure. Because in a lot of cases, you know, your circumstances might be bad. And if you're a kid, you really have no control over what the circumstances are because you're not a self-actualized individual yet. Mm-hmm. But to say that you cannot imagine something better, right? That like the entire possibility of your future is already proscribed is first of all, surprisingly Calvinist. And secondly, For a kid like me, growing up in a city that I fucking hated was just another sort of form of discouragement, letting me know that no matter what, I could not imagine a better future than the one that seemed to be out ahead of me. That's a Mm. horrible thing to do to a kid. Genuinely. Yeah, Yeah. no, it is. It's 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 really, really fucked up. It's like it's even more fucked up than expecting your child necessarily to take over your position as as the murderous pig god. Uh in your right. suit made of human skins. <laughs> and that's the burden of being the pig god, it's right? You have to fun. stay in your hometown. You have to deal with your circumstances because if if you're not going to, I mean, what what will the pigs do? Yeah. Without their god. Yeah, it's like being Buffy. You have to stay on the hel- you have to stay on the hellmouth because like mm. otherwise yeah. Yeah. who's going to fight the demons? Who's going to skin the computer science students that show up to the farm? Yeah, like you think the pig god is horrifying. Wait till you find out about the pig devil. (laughs) You see what they're keeping at bay with all of these skinnings. (laughs) Well, speaking of sitting on a hell mouth, when we come back, we'll listen to some more Odyssey. Well, howdy, folks. Freddie Fairweather here, president of the Iowa State Fair Corporation and adherent to the faith of the one true pig god. His curly tail goes spring, spring. Folks, do you like carnivals? Do you like staring at livestock? Do you like to go to Six Flags, but wish it were 80% less safe? 
Then come on down to the Iowa State Fair, the easiest place to get meth that's not every parking lot of every 7-Eleven in the great state of Iowa. Located in the groin of Des Moines, we're the proud home of the Butter Cow, a bovine sculpture made of refined cow juice that will make you say, wow, that sure is a cow carved out of butter. So come on down to the Iowa State Fair and participate in what we refer to as a pig watch, where we just kind of stand around and watch some pigs. Sometimes the pigs oink, sometimes they don't. And for a long time, I thought that was it. That we trot out our prize hogs and gaze at their splendor, their beauty, their little snout snouts that go sniffy sniffy. But what I didn't know, and it took me much too long to realize, was that the pigs... Were watching us back. Silently biding their time, they passed it down through the generations, not through speech as we know it, but through their learned instincts. They heard the cries of their ancestors to learn our patterns, study our behavior, always keep watch. Until the day they revealed the power of their god, the one true pig god. <coughs> who burned away our skin and showed us the truth. We are all made in his image. We are all little piggies. And we are going to market. So come on down to the Iowa State Fairgrounds and get so drunk you vomit on your neighbor's kids. The Iowa State Fair, all's fair in love and bore. Hey there, folks. It's Brian. Uh, as you can tell, I sound a little bit different. I'm away from my apartment and my microphone right now. But this second half is going to be a little funny. We had some big technical problems that all happened at the same time. And so this second half is from our single track audio backup. So it's going to be a little bit rougher. It's going to sound a little bit different. Sorry about that. It's just the way it is sometimes. We've actually been very lucky to never have something quite like this happen before. And so here's to another 90 or so episodes of good luck anyway on with the show we're back and this is episode 276 third degree get it it's the third mm. one it's yeah. the third mm. part get yeah, it I, the thing we actually haven't talked about yet which is very interesting is that wit has mm. now been replaced uh in the intro it's no longer wit yeah Welcome that's true to the odyssey it's switching off between bernard and eugene and i think the eugene in- intro for this episode is very good the bernard intros are deply strange. He says, <laughs> then again, getting my squeegee caught in my suspenders is exciting to me. And I have some notes on that. I have some <laughs> thoughts, yeah. perhaps on the placement of the squeegee and what yeah. uh, this might encourage in children to experiment with squeegees. And you don't want them experimenting with squeegees too early before, you know, they know sure. that that's a thing they're going to, you know, uh, be able to handle safely. Well, so I think I think the problem with experimenting with squeegees is not necessarily the squeegees themselves being dangerous, but rather that you're going to be experimenting them with them at gas stations, right? That's the usual place where you're going to encounter a squeegee. Ooh. Yeah, right. you don't want a gas so, station squeegee. You got to get your own personal one at home. You got to clean it. Yeah, yeah, after yeah, every yeah, use. yeah. Yeah, but like the thing is, you know, you got to wipe the bugs off of your windshield. So right. Then, you know, it's just one step to then you're playing with gas pumps. Yeah. And you're just spraying gasoline mm. everywhere. So this, not this again. Is a Marshall Younger episode. Once more, we've got a second Marshall Younger episode. And a you second can tell Marshall Younger is because hit the it's Odyssey. a little weird. The road trip continues. Uh, we're in Colorado now. We got the clip for that. Uh, where are we? Colorado. You don't see me. Uh, precisely where in Colorado are we? I don't know. I was on a nice little road that suddenly fed onto this island. May I ask why you're traveling so slowly? Ah, the truck can't handle the altitude too well. The engine what? chokes out at speeds higher than 40 miles an hour. I see. That's a real thing. Can't believe yeah. the maniacs they let on the road these days. What is this? I think he wants you to pull over. What? The sirens, How Bernard. Can that be? I, I didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, Josh, I mean, you, you, you're a sea level boy. 
Uh, so you don't know this, but yeah, high altitudes can be problems, especially for old vehicles. Mm. Uh, they do need certain adjustments made because of uh, air pressure, things of that nature. Sure, sure. A lot of a lot of little Colorado jokes in here because, of course, focus on the family has just moved from the Pomona area to Colorado Springs. Well, and they make oh, Pomona right. jokes in this episode, in, in, in these they episodes do. too. They mention Pomona yeah. numerous times, and then yeah, Colorado. It's yeah, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? It's like our references to all the pyramids and. <laughs> <laughs> and and Bernard thinks Bernard has this idea in his head that as long as he's under the speed limit, no matter what what speed he's going, it should be just fine. Now, However, this is this is a ridiculous thing to think. It's a ridiculous I, notion. It is. It is indeed. It's it's a child's idea of how speed limit signs work. Like, am I supposed to believe that this man like this? This just completely how defies a man? any sort of credulity whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Like, given everything right. we know about Bernard as a character, one of the things that he's going to understand is the nature of speed limits as well as speed minimums. But he's under the minimum. It's very telling that, like, what their philosophy on life is is also dictated by the way they drive their car. It's the slow life, right? It's the slow, simple mm -hmm. life back in Odyssey. It's not these high-speed highways where you have to go... <laughs> a blistering 50 miles an hour. Uh, 40! 40 is the minimum! He can't even pull 40! You're giving me a ticket for going too slow? Yes, we have a minimum speed limit to prevent cars from becoming a hazard for other drivers. Well, with all the people flying by me at 100 miles an hour, you're calling me a hazard? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just in a different just in a different way this doesn't like yeah. somebody who presumably has to do quite a lot of driving as part of their job this should not be mysterious right to them and like it, yeah it, and something that i do think is like interesting just in terms of like the kind of the shifting uh, like the shifting boundaries of uh of what is deemed to be a, a kind of a good life according to american conservatism like i think I can't imagine there being a sympathetic character in a similar thing now who drives too slowly. Like surely, yeah, yeah. right. It, like surely, like the kind of the the the, the vibe now would be uh, would be sort of something along the lines of, oh yeah, like this, like the speed limit is a kind is like a kind of imposition uh, by by big government, and you should be able to drive however fast you want because like if you're a good driver, you'll be able to do it safely. Right. They're trying to take away. Uh, your right, your God-given right to to drive, to drive at a proper speed on these roads. Yeah. And something that I found like super interesting is that there doesn't seem to be any particular interest in defining the terms of masculinity and like what counts as conservative or that for that matter Christian mm -hmm. masculinity. Mm -hmm. Like there's, which I think is which I think is interesting, particularly given that it's supposed to be kind of modeling a way of like a way of life to children. I yeah. thought it would be like quite interested in like kind of in like kind of defining uh, like the kind of the boundaries of like gendered roles and like gendered behavior. But there doesn't but no one seems to be like that interested in that or like certainly not in these like kind of I appreciate these are kind of bottle episodes, but I was surprised that there wasn't a kind of a well, I'm a man. So like. I can drive however the hell I want. Like, well, yeah, they just lost sort of their main guiding light of masculinity, which right. is like the, the aspirational uh, okay, of wit. Sure. And so it, you do kind of feel like the show in flux, like it really is trying desperately to shift gears. There's no dynamic for them to play off of. Neither of them really, I think, embody the traditional idea of like conservative masculinity. And in fact, mm. bump up against it often in these episodes and are often like made fools by it, especially with this cop in this episode that is surprisingly a cab in a way <laughs> I was say, it is like it's surprisingly a cab like even like even when again like the <laughs> the the line i thought that it was gonna go down is completely different to where it actually goes what i thought it was gonna it was gonna it was gonna do was something along the lines of you know well rules are there for a reason and mm -hmm. Uh, you do what law enforcement tells you because even though God's law is the highest law, while you are here on earth, you have to listen to a cop. You got to, you know, yeah, like yeah. But but that's not 
But that's not the moral at all. No. The moral mm. is you got to be around people who are who who you disagree with in order to kind of live a kind of kind of healthy godly life which is so so weird like there is no like exoneration or redemption for this cop at all like the cop genuinely is seems to be running a scam to to find people yeah unfairly i i'm i'm going to disagree with that because i think that with the decision that Bernard makes at the end of the episode, the the cops and the justice system are 100% correct. And honestly, in this situation, they are correct. He's driving far too slow. Yeah, he's going 32 on yeah. an interstate highway that has a in posted Colorado, minimum of 40. Which means that you're not going to be going on like straight shots, right? You're going around mountains and everything. You're going to be turning. You can't just have a car that's going 32 miles an hour in that right. situation. Yeah, it's not just lorry drivers. Everyone in Colorado has a Rizzler as <laughs> as they're driving. I don't I don't. The Does the Rizzler slow except, you down? I don't the Rizzler will do whatever he pleases. <laughs> I don't think he accepts that the police officer is right. I think that it's more that he that he doesn't want to be stuck in a cell with sure. this kind of unhinged militia man. Well, Which let's we'll let's to, let, yeah. let's yeah, hold those yeah. two things in tension in our minds <laughs> okay. here, and then we'll see when we get well, to I the end what side we fall. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So after Bernard gets pulled over, you know he's a little bit frustrated. He feels so extraordinary. Something's got a hold of him. And uh, he decides to contest the charge, even though Means Eugene's another, like another week of hotel expenses. It's like Eugene's like, this is insane. <gasps> you know, just pay the ticket. Keep going. It's going to be way more expensive to stay here and contest it. But Bernard's like, no, this is a matter of principle. It would be so much cheaper just to buy a different truck at this point. Yeah. As opposed is, to doing this weird swap in but San again, Diego. It's, like, that's also the joke, right? Like you can tell yeah. that's kind of what they're going for here is by the end, by the time he gets there, any savings Bernard would have had on this truck have been far outstripped by the cost of the trip itself. Yeah. Go so for it. as they're leaving the courtroom, you know, they're still talking about their issue and they, they a, a helpful law clerk decides to butt in. Working here in the courthouse gives me a slight advantage on such matters. Yeah, well, sure. Go ahead. In actuality, I'm not supposed to disclose this information, but have you ever heard of Johnson versus Arizona? No. Of course, Johnson versus Arizona, a classic case of a policeman's word against that of an ordinary citizen. How did Johnson ever think he could beat the entire state of Arizona? You mean you're familiar with it? Only as well, a cursory I... interest, but you are correct. That would be a magnificent precedent to use. Look, it, I did... It would be the simplest precedent. However, if you want to stretch your imagination slightly, mm -hmm. there are literally hundreds of other cases you could use. Warren versus Jordan, Masco versus Georgia. Uh, I don't really you think the don't... Masco case might be overly circumstantial? It depends on the angle. Uh -huh. Though there was a famous related case which would serve you even better. It's called the, the Fillmore, Fillmore Act, Act of 1974. 1974. Of course. Of and they rip off choice. each other's now, Excuse me. Can I go now or do you two want to get married first? I'm sorry. Oh, hey. Whoa. So now we know what Kenneth the Page was doing before he worked at 30 Rock. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> they're citing completely made up precedent and there are a lot of very made up citations which makes it incredibly jarring when they start to reference real things mm, in this mm -hmm. episode sure. this is the same actor who played Connie's uh, gay boyfriend. Oh yeah, in that oh yeah, Mitch, right? Mitch? Way, way back with Scott Benson. Uh, his uh, name uh, is his. The character's name is Bryant Jennings. Uh, Get it? Uh, Get it? Uh, like this is a reference to William Jennings Bryan, uh, a lawyer who famously fought in the Scopes Monkey Trial. Yep, and he defended what? the monkeys. Uh, Again, the all the cultural references in Odyssey are from like 1920 to like 1954. Yes. And then it's just nothing after yeah. that. Yeah, Scopes, Scopes trial was 1925. So you're exactly Scopes, right. AJ. The Scopes monkey trial was determining whether we could teach evolution in American schools. Whether There's a play Darwin about it called Inherit the Wind, which yep. is very boring, but people do it. It's uh, very popular in schools. Like this is more rank ingratitude from from Bernard. Yeah. Like, this, clerk, this clerk is presumably putting his job on the line in order to help him get out of this completely reasonable speeding ticket. Eugene is like, is kind of, is kind of applying his kind of vast knowledge of American history. Uh, and, and like his response is just like, what are you two gay? Like it, that's, <laughs> such a, that's, such a, that's such a strange thing to say to people who are trying to who are trying like do, are trying to assist you um 
Every, I, I actually, I, I, I really enjoyed this episode because it reminded me of my favorite kind, my favorite kind of guy. You must have these in America as well. They're mm. a kind of, they're a kind of libertarian. They're a kind of mm-hmm. sector of libertarians, but they are a one-issue libertarian. Yeah, and yeah. their whole thing is parking fees. Yes, <laughs> and, uh, yes. Uh-huh. and all yeah. they think about is parking fees. Uh, I watched this documentary about them once, and there was a guy who had written a protest song, like a Dylan-style protest mm-hmm. song, <laughs> about parking fees. Yep. Uh, there's a thing well, that you can... Why won't the meter? I'm yeah, you know, it's ex- exactly that. I just want to leave my car in the parking lot. It's <laughs> common land. I'm a freeman of the land. Oh, it was like God. that. Like, imagine <laughs> that. Imagine, imagine that. Uh, it's uh. Worse, worse to that effect. Um, and that uh, they have a special uh, notice that you can print out and put in your windshield. That's awesome. Which uh, quotes from the Magna Carta, of course yes. it does. Yes. Um, yes, mm-hmm. yes. Um, and it says something along the lines of, I am a freeman of the land and I do not mm-hmm. consent to be governed by your laws. Yep. Yes. Allegedly, if you put this in your, yep. in your windshield, then you are not subject to parking fees. And... Uh, and apparently if you work in like a kind of local magistrate's court, these guys are the absolute scourge because they will show up to challenge a parking fine and they will show up with these like tabbed folders yep. and yeah. they know like every precedent. And it's just like, think of what you could like, considering these, these people have, they have like endless time apparently mm-hmm. um, and significant energy. Like think of the good that they could be doing. Rather yeah. than rather than like kind of pitching tantrums about yeah. about parking tickets and like ev- and I really really thought that this was where this was going to go with Vernon. I thought he was going <laughs> to get really kind of like really really turn into one of these guys and he kind of sort yeah. of does and Almost, then he meets yeah. someone who really really is one of these right. guys and he's like yeah. but. No, I don't want to be like him. I don't right, not right. like him. <laughs> yeah. No, they, they, I, don't, they, I don't have a I don't have a barn full of weapons. Not like him. <laughs> there yeah. very much is an equivalent. I mean, it, it is the same guy. And I would argue that that kind of guy is even more common here because of the fact that America is the car country. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Well, and, and we're just we're freer anyway. Like we have that's true. We have more freedom. freedoms than you. Yeah. yeah. So we have um, more people who are willing to defend freedom and right. Die exactly. For it. Of course. Mm-hmm. Of course. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I mean, here rather than free men on the land, they're called sovereign citizens, but they do the exact same shit. They all live in New Hampshire. Um, and <laughs> yeah, just or what it is. honestly, New Mexico. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there, there is a town of these people in New Hampshire that was overrun by bears. Mm hmm. Uh, in, it's a very fascinating story. Uh, if if you want to just Google New Hampshire and town bears, here's the thing. Yeah, the bears paid for their parking. <laughs> yeah, wow. they sure did. They ins- they actually set up a really wonderful government there. It was it <laughs> it was a really a socialist <laughs> utopia, and then the government came in and killed all those bears. So we'll get back to Odyssey's sort of discussion of the nuances of libertarianism in a little bit because it is oddly <laughs> the thing that this episode hinges around. But yeah. before yeah. we get there. Uh, let's move on with Eugene's branch of this story because uh, Jennings offers to take Eugene along to a philosophy get together with some buds. And I wrote in parentheses in all caps, not gay, which Eugene <laughs> uh-huh. is, of course, down for. What is it that you do, Eugene? I am a student at Campbell College in Odyssey. Oh, would that be named after Thomas Campbell? Yes, we must learn our lessons in verse. <laughs> oh, I've used that witticism a myriad of times. Actually, it is Josiah Campbell. Good thing. If it was Thomas Campbell, you'd be programming computers in Gaelic. <laughs> or if it was Malcolm Campbell, you'd be required to drive 260 miles an hour to class. <laughs> or if it were Beatrice Tanner Campbell, the final exam would be a performance of The Merchant of Venice. <laughs> Brian, you knew that last reference, Harry didn't you? Campbell and, uh, well, uh, no, wait. Wait a minute, never mind. That's my cousin. You wouldn't know him. I like that one. Um, but no, well, this is weird because there there is no there is no Beatrice Tanner Campbell. There was an actress named Mrs. Campbell or Mrs. Patrick Campbell or Mrs. Pat, mm. uh, whose name was in real life Beatrice Tanner. Hmm. Uh, she's the original Eliza Doolittle. Oh, I think she was 50 when she played her. And I don't mean Eliza Doolittle, of course, in the musical. That was uh, Julie Andrews. Uh, but in right. Uh, George Bernard in, in Pygmalion. Pygmalion. Did you already I don't know, know why that? I didn't do a Pygmalion going into reference. this, or did no? Because you... I, I was confused by 
I had heard of Mrs. Patrick Campbell. Okay. I had not heard of Beatrice Tanner Campbell. So I had to I had to Google her because I was like, wait, these other names are real people. Yeah. I like that there's just some guy on a pipe flute standing yeah. in the background of that entire scene. I imagine he's like dressed in a full satyr outfit and is just kind of hopping from one hoot foot to the other as they're talking about like all this philosophy and <laughs> Mr. stuff. Tumness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, this is just really not where I expected it to go. I was a bit like, look, I don't, I don't care for you, Eugene. I find you, I find you irksome company, but I can, appre- <laughs> I can appreciate that, that it would be good for you to kind of be amongst your own kind. And he mm-hmm. seems like he seems genuinely happy and excited to meet these people who like, who like, he seems to kind of experience joy around yeah. them. And we have not heard him, uh, exp- we have not heard him convey any emotion other than kind of free floating anxiety and, and worry that he is yet again pissed Bernard off because he has broken one of Bernard's hundreds of unreasonable social rules and Uh like just so like he's got so many so he's like constantly kind of like on edge and then he meets his people and they can start and they can riff on the Campbells and they can talk about computers and and he's like and he's like so and it's like watching a kind of like a, like a lion that has been raised in a sanctuary being released out into the wild and it runs Touching. off and it joins all the other little lions. Touching and grass for the first time. It's touch, yeah. it's touching grass for the first time. And that is, oh, when I tell you that that's not the moral of the story nope. in any way, nope. shape or form, the moral of the story is not find your community, find your, find your people. Um, if you don't have a family of your own, then maybe, then maybe God will give you give you fellowship whether that is in your work in your hobby whether that's like whether that's through the church no 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 that's not that's not what they're saying at all what they're saying is if you find people you like no that's no good yep no yep. good i'm yeah. afraid bad yeah. bad news eugene you're gonna be stuck with fucking bernard forever yep. <laughs> because it is ungodly for you to be around people that you like and who make you feel comfortable and who make you feel relaxed in your own skin that's bad that's a bad thing and yeah. something that that should be noted that you didn't know coming into this episode, or, or unless we have it in the dossier, Eugene is an orphan. He doesn't even have family. There is no one of like mind that he has ever had in his life. Yeah. Oh, no. So this is like really the first community that he finds. And what does Bernard do? Complain that they just don't make living rooms anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the hill he's going yeah, he's to die on. He's munching on trail mix while Eugene is is thrilled at all of his new homosexual friends that he can watch <laughs> Icelandic <laughs> movies with. Yeah, <laughs> the Reykjavik Chronicles. Yeah, Reykjavik yeah, not Chronicles. a real movie. Not a real. Not a thing that exists. It all takes place in an airport. Uh, Apparently, it has a lot of montage. Meanwhile, Bernard has this court case coming up, right? And uh, he enters his plea. He and Eugene have been preparing this whole case, but the judge just immediately is like, no, just like, Yeah, I don't care about precedent. This is traffic court. Yeah, tell me what happened. Uh, Here it is. Uh, I was traveling on the interstate, but at a slow pace due to the inabilities of my vehicle to go over 40 miles per hour. Uh, Wait a minute. Why couldn't your car go over 40? Oh, it's, it's an old Same truck. Actor it's not policeman. used to the altitude. Oh, so you were driving uh-huh. an impaired vehicle? Well, yes. No. I mean, it wasn't until I got here. Why didn't you get it fixed before you drove it? It didn't need fixing. It's your altitude. All right, That's then. We'll simply have your truck adjusted before you leave town, and we'll dismiss the fine. No. Reasonable. No. Why yes. should I pay to have my truck adjusted when I'm just passing through? Because your slow driving is a hazard. Be careful, Mr. Walton. I could have you pay to adjust your truck and pay the traffic fine. You can't do that. Watch me. Mr. Walton, you're sentenced to vehicular repairs and the fine ensued upon the receipt of the citation. Next. I have a precedent. Yes, I do. Wait a minute. Right here. Uh, like critical many, support, many cases, Lord yeah. 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 Johnson <laughs> versus in this, in this Arizona. Episode. Mr. Walton. The man yeah. took on an entire state. I'm not going to tell you again. It's a scam. I heard about this on TV. You're all con artists. I brought this binder. It has so many tabs. And like, there, there are, of course, real 
speed trap areas. They usually don't go after people driving too slow. He'd usually be in the right. Like, uh, I mean, Josh, you're from Grand Rapids. You know that road when you go through Indiana on the way to Chicago. Well, or the I speed got limit just drops like there a stone. is in Bristol, Tennessee, right outside of the speedway, actually, like the racetrack. There is an <laughs> infamous speed trap right there that I got caught in one time. Yeah, Lads, we're well, back in geography. We got to yeah. get out of geography. I, I had this. I, this happened to me once in Las Lunas where I got pulled over for going 20 over the speed limit. But oh, the shit. sign where the speed limit was supposed to drop was still in front of me. Fucking cop. A piece of <laughs> shit. You could have contested anyway, that. I could have contested that, but then I would have had to go back to Las Lunas, Josh. Fair play. The, this, whole, this whole plot line is so interesting because Bernard is acting in a way that is unreasonable and mm-hmm. is yeah. sort of bad, right? And so you're like, okay, that's great. He's going to learn a lesson from this. Uh, and he, you know, this is like about him getting out of the way of his own pride and yeah. just like yeah. paying the fine. And then it just doesn't really do that. It's the only reason he's convinced is because he's thrown in jail with a man who may not exist. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, there's, it's it's it, yeah. It's the newsroom. Um, it's this really interesting. <laughs> it's thing. any Aaron Sorkin project. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's always there's an imaginary friend at imaginary one point guy. somewhere. It's interesting to see in this episode that like yeah oh Bernard is a crank, but to the audience listening to adventures in odyssey bernard does not sound that unusual or unreasonable mm. right? i don't know in that general, I in general oh, oh not, okay. not necessarily right now but in like this in general case. and then sure. but but this is totally consistent with him like this is yeah. not out of the blue that bernard would be doing this but like he's a crank he, yeah. he's a true crank yeah and it's it's really interesting to see marshall younger have this insight into who Bernard is and he's able to to hit on that in a way that's going to be a lot more realistic than I think we see with Eugene and mm. his plot mm-hmm. mm. uh, because now Bernard finds himself in a cell and he he comes across a very helpful man with a lot of similar ideas to yeah him. but I guess I'd better go ahead and pay so I can get out of here no 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 don't do it don't let them get to you come again that's exactly what they want you to do They want you to fold under their pressure just so they can show you that they're in charge. (laughs) Well, they're not. Yeah, well, actually, they are. Who says so? Did they ever ask your permission to be in charge? (laughs) No. Did the policeman give you a chance to argue when you were stopped? As a matter of fact, no. (laughs) Did they even let you say what you wanted to say in court? (laughs) He no, did, in as many words. It's a scam. You know, I kind of thought that way from the very beginning. You, you must be right. Of course I'm right. This is America. I'm you. That's right. They can't get away with this. Uh, so, what are you going to do about it? What am I going to do? I'm going to write my congressman. No. No? No. Not quite. No. I'll tell no. what you're going to do. Uh-huh. You're going to wait him out. You're going to stay in this jail and enjoy yourself because you know what? What? That's exactly what they don't want. He's they've got it. Like this is this really is like what Sov sits are like. Yeah, the, the one thing they missed is that he should have advised Bernard to say that he was traveling rather than driving. Mm, uh that mm. that that's a famous one that they love to use yep. when they're pulled over as well as in traffic court to be like, well, technically I was merely traveling, therefore I do not fall under your law. <laughs> <laughs> my, my oh favorite. wow! I, I didn't know that. But he, that... he does sort of say that. He says, "I'm just passing through. So mm-hmm. why right, should right, I have right, to right, adjust right, right. my truck?" True. But you have to say traveling because what's important to you sovereign have to citizens say traveling. and freedom of the land is like you have to get the words exactly correct. Right? Because they think it's, it's almost like a magic. It's a cheat, it's a cheat, cheat code. code. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, it's the, the Konami same thing. Code it's of like whenever, work. whenever the president does a speech in front of a flag that has a fringe on it, that's not really the American flag. That's an admiralty flag, and not just that they put the fringe on it because it looks fancier. Right. Um, there, <laughs> in the same way that the British ones have the Magna Carta. Of course, we have all of these weird ideas about the Constitution, the Federalist mm. Papers. There's this whole mythology about how America has been a corporation ever since Ulysses S. Grant became president. And uh, that was one of the big things with uh, January 6th and 2020 and everything is that like Donald Trump was going to overturn the election by 
overturning whatever thing they think Grant signed to make him finally the first legitimate president right. in 150 Usually years. the Federal oh, Reserve is tied wow. into this somehow. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, all... The sinking of the Titanic, people believe that that <laughs> is, uh, that yeah. coincides with the creation of the Federal Reserve because of uh, I don't know. A Jew did it or something, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, no, that's just... the new truth. That's the new trutherism is that the Titanic didn't sink oh, or that it AJ, was it's uh, yeah. not new. <laughs> oh, it's not. <laughs> well, it's the first I'm hearing about it. I, I, I lack the, the poster spirit. Unfortunately. Uh, Phoebe, I, I, I see your it's eyes just lighting up mind. with with many thoughts. <laughs> it just sounds like such an exhausting way to live. To be honest with you, I don't know how I can. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know how you can be bothered. Like there's so, it feels like there's like there's so much that you can point to, which really is bad and corrupt, and examples of how like the mechanics of power and capital just grind ordinary people under its like under its wheels. There's like so much of it, and yes, and you're sitting there being like, look at the flag. Yeah. <laughs> what, is that the is that is that technically the right flag for people who are going around being like we're the we're the free people we are the we are the sovereign citizens with the free people of the land like imagine being like so fixated on tech, like techni- like technicalities and rules mm-hmm. as well I, like I appreciate they're not anarchists but like but by the, but by the same token like yeah, yeah like- I'm gonna be like I'm gonna be a totally free citizen um, as long as I say exactly the right as long as I say exactly the right words yeah. and as long as I, as long as I don't like have the wrong kind of flack, that's very, that's mental. <laughs> it's like they, yeah. they need to be rebels against the government, but also be the most patriotic guy who mm-hmm. believes mm. 100% in the government. And so they have to come up with a mythology that's basically like the creation happened and then we had the fall. There was some point where Adam ate the apple and all we need to do is just have a Jesus Christ of government to bring back the constitution or the, the Magna Carta or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have I have a genuine question for everybody because I am thoroughly convinced in one camp of this. But like, do we think the guy in the cell exists? Because Eugene yes. never never talks to him, <laughs> never once acknowledges that Eugene even hears him. It is so. Weird. Yeah, that later scene is, is very strange because Eugene only seems to hear what Bernard is saying. Yeah. So mm. my theory is that Bernard has gone full Pepe Silvia and has like, <laughs> like uh, done an entire like yarn thing across his cell uh, during his like cleanup or whatever, and has concocted this entire conspiracy theory that Eugene can then come in and then he starts realizing he starts listening to his delusions and realizing how deluded they are and is able to sort of pull himself back from no. that. I mean, it's just. <laughs> but you the, can make an argument that it is. In oh, a you. In a lot of yeah. in a lot of other episodes of Odyssey, I feel like they're just so literal, and they'll always be like, "No, the thing that the cool thing you're thinking is wrong." Yeah. This is the one where there at least is some wiggle room to be like, "Well, maybe." Yeah, the, the, I would say the answer for me is no, just because Odyssey doesn't do that. But I do think it is more fun to imagine that it is that way. So if mm. you want to make that your head and I'm fine with it. Also, they kiss. Then no, that yeah, and sovereign citizens Fuck. aren't real, and they can't hurt you. So. So Eugene goes back to the the cult of gay nerds. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. They, they, in the meantime, have offered one of them has offered Eugene a job or more yeah. accurately, his uncle has offered Eugene a job at his computer store. Yeah, yeah. his uncle works at Nintendo. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it would, be, it would be programming computers at the store. Right. Which we love programming computers at the store, don't we, folks? Yeah, <laughs> boutique programming house. The original Apple Genius Bar, yeah. So Eugene has been spending more and more time with the cult of gay nerds, and yeah. they decide to, as a group, have a discussion. And it sounds like this. Okay. Tonight's topic is philosophy, science, or speculation. Hmm. Oh, good. Let's open up the floor for discussion. Okay. Oh, good. Well, I've always agreed with Russell's theory. Uh, very oh, good. So yes. Hi. So do I. Uh, anybody else? Mm-hmm. All right. That was good. Uh, anybody wants to hear <laughs> uh, Excuse me. Yes, Eugene. Um... That was the discussion? Yes. No arguments, no opposing theories, no debate? We're all agreed. Why do we need to debate it? Yes. Well, uh, primarily because yes. that's the very definition of the word discussion. Do you agree with the Russell theory? Well, of course I do. But is there no one in this room who thinks any differently? My apologies. Famously, no conflict in, 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 in academic circles. None. Uh, 
No. Never <laughs> once have, has anyone ever disagreed about anything in, Every, in, everyone, in the gay nerd The thing is, call. like, Bertrand Russell is the great uh, equalizer. You know, the, you can't disagree with Bertrand Russell at any point in time. Who no, is no one that? Ever has. Who is this? Who, Bertrand oh, okay. Russell? He's a philosopher. Why, why, what has everyone um, agreed on here? What, what are they agreeing on, is my question. Oh, we it's it it doesn't matter. Like they, they're just all in agreement because that's <laughs> no, what the I don't know if it's like a subtle require. I know, it's but not, it's, it's, it's not, not a subtle th- dig against them in any way. I, I don't think, think so. it's a subtle dig at like uh, atheists. I, honestly. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah. Like, yeah, like but uh, uh, Bertrand Russell was was it him who came up with the, the flying teapot about how that made as much sense to him as the idea of there being a god? Yeah, I think I'm just trying to think what theory it could be that Eugene is supposed to be. I don't want to give the writers too much credit here because I think it's entirely possible that they were just like philosophers who suck brackets right. ungodly, I, I, I or, like, so. were, or like yeah. or like or like and they just like kind of picked the first guy. It was because, like either him or atheist Nietzsche. philosopher, yeah. Yeah, because like as so far as I'm aware, it is a long it's a long time since I've read Neil Russell. I had to read him at school. He didn't have like a kind of grand unifying theory. Right. Well, he was he, primarily a mathematician, right? So like- yeah, he was he was like he was really really keen on class. He was really really keen on logic and classical logic as well. Mm-hmm. But what Eugene seems to be saying is that he goes along with Russell's theory about like whether or not philosophy is uh like. Is like a is like a science or or something else. The point here is not to delve into any aspect of philosophy. The point here is to show how insular, like-minded people uh, develop sort of a cult-like uh, similarity of ideas. And after this happens, the <laughs> group really starts turning the screws to Eugene. They just become Screw more tapes. and more culty. I must say that there are people in Odyssey whom I would greatly miss. Who are these people, Eugene? Are you going to miss your small town rustic friends? Oh no, Tell they're me, elites. Oh Where no, oh you going no. To find a group of people that are on your oh, intellectual God, oh, level. Fuck. Certainly not in Odyssey. You belong with people like us. Your the equals, equals if not, not your, your betters. betters. Not those small minded yokels in Odyssey. It's a clear decision, Eugene. Listen to us. Let us help you. Watch out, Eugene. You're going to get trapped in big city Colorado. Yeah, he's like, found, where are he, they? He where found, are they? He found the coastal elites in Durango. Colorado. <laughs> Tell you right. <laughs> God. Yeah, like, like they frame it obnoxiously, but are they wrong in anything that they've <laughs> no. said? Oh, no. Him? I mean, the thing that sucks is that, like, yeah, they just they're just not interesting people, though. Like, mm. at first they seemed nice, but, like, they all just are like, yeah, I like Bertrand Russell. Yeah, me too. They watch that Icelandic movie every single week. In right? that, they don't even have a fancy movie time where they switch the movies around. Come on! Yeah. In that, that could be a fun thing to play with in a better version of this script, where it's mm-hmm. like, on first glance, this group of people really seemed to be interesting and on your level and willing to engage, but, in fact... You know, they are also cosplaying in a way they have their own blind spots. Turns out that lots of different people are lots of different ways in that yeah. somebody who appears similar to you at first might not actually be as similar to you as they be, think. Be, but that's yeah. not the point here at all. It, and maybe take, what yeah. who you have more in common with are the people from your hometown who like maybe you're not don't share all the same interests, but you share the same values and right. so on and so forth. No, that's not what they're, that's not no, what yeah. they're saying at all. You, you what all, they're saying is it should the be outsiders together. Yeah, it's 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 really really strange, particularly since and this is not a new point. Obviously, like many many people have said this before, but like whenever they go down this kind of line, oh, is there no one that thinks differently? Are you afraid of disagreement? And just once, just once, I'd like <laughs> to see one of these people put their money where their mouth is and like actually like seek out like a Maoist or something and just be like, <laughs> right, let's let's hear what you got to say. Because yeah. I'm not afraid of people who think right. differently to me. Right. Um, yeah. Right. Like, obviously, their only thought of, like, atheists or non-Christian gay nerds is that they're all big fans of Bertrand Russell. Would They've probably yeah. never even heard of him. Hi. <laughs> well, and, and further to uh, confuse the situation, back in jail, that sovereign citizen... Uh, continues to attempt to harass the authorities, uh, maybe or maybe not a figment of Bernard's imagination. Um, but it turns out that he's also a revolutionary Marxist. Yeah. <laughs> Look, uh, Stanley, Stanley, could we maybe just call it a day and pick up tomorrow? I mean, it's getting late and you've been doing that all night. What? 
You want to sleep? Well, I... Are you not willing to sacrifice sleep in order to bring justice to America? Huh? Hey, you want to hear what I've sacrificed? Stanley, I'd like to hear it. Tomorrow. Stanley I've sat in a cell. Stanley years. was a cultural I Marxist. I've seen my wife and kids for six <laughs> months. Six months! Divorced. He's divorced. We should have known. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Eugene gets back to the jail, and uh, as is inevitable, Bernard betrays the revolution. He says to Eugene, won't you please let me go? These words lie inside. They hurt me so. This guy, this is a real type of guy in a way that Eugene's nerd friends are not. They are yes. constructs. They feel like they're being imagined more than yes. this dude in the jail cell. Uh, <laughs> this is definitely someone that Marshall Younger has encountered in his life yep. in a way that he he hasn't with all the nerds. Why are all the nerds gay why are they all so <laughs> they like they're like okay we need to we need to cast some coastal elites and then a bunch of people came in with these very sibilant s's yeah very you know very mm. very pretty musical cadences and they're like there we go that's our cast of nerds i'm not going to interrogate yeah. this further yeah, yeah I, I thought i thought i was going to get a job at computer shop and here i am surrounded by fucking hotel receptionists what the fuck <laughs> why does everyone have a mustache <laughs> <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on the gay nerds phoebe why why are all these nerds why are all these nerds trying to suck my cock what is going on <laughs> it's, 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 it's a, a huge question, problem for josh you I can't walk it, down the which street. i think we which i think we need answering i i, I don't know i kind of want to i kind of want to think a little bit more about the about your man in the prison cell because mm. like if he is a figment of Bernard's uh, of Bernard's <laughs> imagination yes right. i think that exactly. actually raises a fairly interesting theory of mind which as far as i'm aware uh Bertrand Russell was also quite <laughs> quite interested. <laughs> in. I was going to um, say, theory of mind. Uh, Who are you, Bertrand Russell? Bringing this around. What, what is interesting to me about this about this theory of mind, a theory of mind here, is what do you do when your Tyler Durden goes off piste like this? Like, mm, yeah, because the thing that because the thing that puts it because it doesn't put him on the straight and narrow. It doesn't get him back on the right track it's that he is horrified if he is not a, if he's not real if he's a figment of his imagination he is mm -hmm. horrified by the phantasm that his own imagination has produced yeah which yeah. is either a revolutionary marxist or a kind of fascist adjacent adjacent militia man it's like it's sort of not quite clear i think there's a reasonable argument for both to be honest with yeah. you just based I, on what he has to say <laughs> i think too that if we if we see him i'm actually coming around now to the idea that this is a figment of bernard's yes! imagination because it would out. it I'm would also out. clarify why his politics are as inchoate as they are because bernard clearly is also not a person who would have like a, a an actual understanding of the political spectrum and the tendencies of people on different sides he can only understand understand things as you know people who get it versus outside agitators and that's the struggle that he feels within himself yeah it um, really is an episode about these two guys denying their inner impulses yeah that's right? true like it is about eugene denying his own like effete elite kind of homosexuality that he feels deep mm. within inside himself and it is and it is bernard denying his own col either cultural uh, either either like revolutionary marxist or uh <laughs> fascist that lies dormant inside of him his, and it's just his, like his sort it's of a very Birch centrist society. episode yeah yeah, yeah. birch society homosexuality which is i think its that, own kind of homosexuality i think we've talked to this flag I think we've talked this episode into being better than it is. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, right. Because yeah. where it actually ends in the didactic message that Chris gives us at the end is that sometimes the people who help us the most are the ones who are different from us. And, mm. uh, you know, what they really need, what we all really need is someone who has a different view on life. But the thing is, as long as they're not a gay nerd, that's the thing, right? It, yeah. it is is. It can be a different view so long as they are also a fellow evangelical Christian, basically. Yeah. Diversity yeah. of thought is welcome inside the tent, but do not step outside the tent. Neither of them do very well out of being out of looking for someone who is different from them to help them. Well, but yeah. the, what they're trying to say, and again, this is, comes down to how inchoate it is, is that like these people are too similar to them. The issue is that Eugene's, um, you know, gay salon friends are too similar to him. They are they are too learned. They they are too of one mind. 
Uh, Bernard's friend, I guess, is also too similar to him in that he doesn't like the government. Like, it doesn't yeah. fucking make sense. But the thing that you're yeah. supposed mm. to take away from it, as with the previous episode that we talked about, is where you're at is where you need to be. And if you think that there's the possibility of being around people who maybe, you know, will make you feel better than being inside of the evangelical bubble that you're in. You're fucking wrong, kid. But if you meet people who you like too much, that's also a bad. That's yes. also a bad thing. And if you have, uh, if you have a kind of voice in your head that is urging you to think about the consent to be policed, uh, then you, you, that's not gonna. That's not gonna help you at all. I actually go back on what I said earlier. It's true that the police, like the police officer, is sort of exonerated, but you are so, you are still supposed to come out of it not necessarily thinking. That the thinking that the the cops and the magistrates were especially good. I don't think I don't think it's supposed to be a kind of uh, like Bernard is is being a kind of an, is is being unruly and like deserves to go to jail. I don't think you're supposed to think that. But he does no. get out because yeah, yeah. It, you know that at the end of the he, day, he, he Eugene, pays the fine. He adjusts the car. Yep. Yeah, Bernard yeah, basically the, says, the, "I don't care because I'm not there, and I don't care if I'm here tomorrow." B- Bernard's arc yeah, on this he, on this road trip really Bernard. is like Tom yeah, Cruise and Eyes Wide Shut. Just <laughs> it's like he's all you just always see him paying out more and more and more and more, just handing wads of cash to people and never ever getting laid. Yeah. <laughs> like meanwhile, Burn like Burn is looking in a looking in a mirror and like when he looks down to like wash it like wash his hands or whatever, like the reflection is still like just like grinning back at him. And that's <laughs> yeah. what he has to that's what he has to like he has to smash the mirror. Um, oh no, the pig god followed him. <laughs> From the pig on him and is in the mirror. Don't go in the fucking treehouse because you know what yeah. you're gonna find in the treehouse. Oh yeah, there's always just like a nude, smiling extra in the background. <laughs> yeah. the whole series and find that he's been there the whole time. Yeah, that nude, yeah. smiling extra, Brian Alford. Oh, so yeah. let's move on to episode two seventy seven. It happened at Four Corners. This is yeah, the final episode of this sure set. Did. After two real duds here in the middle, and arguably three real duds, even by Odyssey standards, this mm-hmm. one's kind of fun. Until the ending. <laughs> <laughs> but we have fun. This we like show, to have fun. these people are cowards. Make this real. I'm so <laughs> mad. I'm so mad at this episode. Wow, because it, spoil it, AJ. Oh, Jeez. yeah. Okay, yeah. sure. Spoil so it, honestly. Yeah, episode. this is a Phil Lawler. I knew it. I fucking knew it. I can <laughs> smell Lawler at this point from fucking space. <laughs> so they're they're driving down the road. They're getting out of Colorado, and they're they're heading to a little landmark that is near and dear to my heart. Mm. Hey, and that was Waylon Waylon with his smash hit. I guess I should have figured out that you were just a dog. Because you lived in apartment K9. <laughs> None of the radio <laughs> jokes land. Do you mind if I turn they this They can't off. write jokes about the radio. Not at all, Lawler Walton. can't write jokes. Maybe we'll hit some excitement in the next town. Well, what is it anyway? According to the Road Atlas, it's a place called Four Corners, Arizona. No, it's not. Hmm. No, it's not called Four Corners, Arizona. It's just called it's Four called Corners. It's the point. Four Corners. It's it the is- point. This is our U.S. Geography episode, goddammit. There's no town (laughs) there. It is literally at the point. So here's what the four corners are. If you had to guess what the four corners Mm. are, what what do you think it is? I would guess it was, I'd guess it was like a kind of big road junction. There's one spot in the entire country where there are four U.S. states that meet at one point. Okay. It it's nothing. It is literally nothing. It's just like, well, we started making the state square and (laughs) over here... There's a point where they meet. So it's called the Four Corners area. It's New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Colorado. Yeah, the Simpsons uh, okay. make a joke about this in the Simpsons movie where they hike to the top oh, and they see right. the four states that border Springfield and yeah. none of them uh, are connected at all. Uh, in Breaking Bad, Skylar goes to the Four Corners at one point when she's thinking about leaving Walt and she flips a coin at that middle marker and sees where it lands as though like she's going to go wherever that coin leads and i think it lands in utah twice and she's like i don't want to fucking deal with mormons and she goes back and fucks walt and <laughs> uh uh there's no town there this isn't four quarters arizona in fact the least amount of things are in arizona uh the south eastern corner the new mexico side the good side is where you have two huts that sell fry bread it's it's actually it's not a national park or a state park or anything it's it's owned by the navajo nation 
So it's uh, oh, interesting. And, and partly by the Ute Nation, because on the Colorado side, that's Ute territory. But um, it's it's fun. It's in the middle of absolutely goddamn nowhere. And you just bake in the sun as you look at this fucking survey marker. That's like, here's where four states are. So that's um, Brian's that. four corners corner. Yeah, I wanted to. <laughs> hey, here's Brian's all Brian's, four of them. <laughs> Brian's desert facts. <laughs> <laughs> so as they proceed uh, through the desert, Bernard says, hey, how about we tell a story? Oh, I know. Uh, we'll do what the pioneers did when they traveled across the frontier. Shoot bears? No. Tell stories. Stories? Yeah, you know, a tale, a yarn. You mean a narrative? Whatever. No, okay, I've got one. Now, I've been told by some reliable sources that this is a true story, but you'll have to judge that for yourself. Hmm. It happened right around this part of the country, as a matter of fact. Two guys were driving out to California to conduct some business. The two were distant cousins and fairly good friends for the most part. But what happened to them on that trip stretched their bloodlines thin and their relationship to the breaking point. And that was... Oh, what in the world is that? It appears to be the automobile behind us. And he's approaching very rapidly. And then the, the car behind them swerves around them, crashes off the road... And we get the Jimmy Durante scene from the beginning of It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. So this is two car crashes in four episodes. Yeah. Uh, it seems as though... And a breakdown. And a breakdown. Uh, it seems as though they're already kind of running out of ideas, and they're four <laughs> episodes into this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I did enjoy how really grotesquely over the top this whole first section is like it is an action scene like there's oh, a yeah. car it's on mm -hmm. fire they're pulling this guy out of a car who sounds like the ancient wizard of route 66 oh yeah 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 we have the clip of him he's really something <laughs> i called in the accident there's a rescue station just a few miles up the road they'll be here in a couple of minutes no don't talk <laughs> just <clears throat> listen there's all this gold, see? More gold than you can dream of. A whole river of it. Underground. An underground river of gold? I think he's in shock, Eugene. He's hallucinating. No! No, I'm not. I've been there. I've seen the river with my what own eyes. What accent is this? Uh, it's <laughs> the a prospector Louisiana, accent. It's a Louisiana <laughs> accent because oh, this okay. is uh, Peter Renaday, who is from Louisiana. Oh, uh, cool. He was born in 1935. He's still alive. He did Adventures wow. in Odyssey episodes starting from here until 2015. Um, he uh, probably most famously is the original voice of Master Splinter in the Teenage Mutant oh, cartoon cool. from the 80s. Oh, cool. Oh, shit. Hey. He was, his early career has a lot of like live action Disney movies. So, you know, the Disney movies that no one wants to remember, like The Cat from Outer Space or The Shaggy D.A., um, oh, that's the one where the dog full on punches a guy, right? Uh -huh. And then jumps out a window and slides down a pole. Yeah, uh, he's he shows up in a lot of like Disney. <laughs> Phoebe, your it's right. <laughs> Phoebe, I'll send you the clip. It's really good. Okay. It'll be is, in the episode well, notes too. Is it DA as in District Attorney? Yes, yes it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a D so it's the Shaggy Dog, but it's a he's an attorney. Well, the thing about but the Shaggy Dog is that it's Broadway's own Dean Jones. Uh, oh my god, who, what? Who occasionally turns into a dog, but not like a werewolf. It's like a domesticated shaggy dog, but Just he still a regular has a dog. job. He still has a job, right? He doesn't have a blog. He's not a dog with a blog, but he is sure. a dog with a, a law office. He's not Bob yeah, Blah Come on. He's a different person. Okay, so, so, so he's not a dog all the time. No. No, no he, but, he is occasionally he is a, a human. dog at very inconvenient moments. Yeah, I'd be questioning the credentials of a law school that gave a law degree to a dog. <laughs> there is nothing in the rules that says you can't give a law degree to a dog. What's true, amazing? True. What's amazing about this movie is that for the most part, it's just a dog. It's just a regular dog <laughs> yeah. that yeah. they like. You hear like his thoughts or whatever. But every once in a while, when there's a stunt that needs to happen, it's a guy in a dog costume. <laughs> oh my that god! They keep cutting back and forth between rapidly that's it's wonderful tremendous he has to open a door at one point and you just see <laughs> just like does. a full man paw come in and open the door and then cut back to just a dog walking in like it's oh <laughs> 
It's a really fun watch. Just so, get, yeah, and, and he drop some acid. Somebody. Watch that. Stay so tuned for it. the fancy movie time episode <laughs> on the Shaggy DA. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I want to get to a little bit more of Pete Renaday's credit. So he's a miscellaneous voices on all kinds of things: Disney movies, uh, cartoons from the '90s, things like that. He did a lot of things for Disney parks. He's the voice of Mark Twain on the Mark Ooh. Twain Riverboat. He's the oh, voice shit. of Abraham Lincoln in the Hall of Presidents. Ooh. He uh, worked on Who Framed Roger Rabbit before Bob Hoskins came in when they were doing screen tests and working on all the animatronics and everything for that. He played Eddie Valiant in those screen hmm. tests, which oh, are kind cool. of famous. You can watch them online. Uh, he's in Fallout New Vegas as Easy Pete and Cannibal Johnson and a whole host of other characters. He was oh, in Metal Gear Solid 2 as Richard Ames. Uh, this guy, this guy is a, this guy a, is a working actor. Yeah. 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 Well, instead, in this, he's just the world's weirdest prospector. <laughs> and he um, dies uh, instantly. He does. And um, it's interesting as well, because like if you think, look at like, look at the kind of span of his roles, like every single one of them is just going to is just going to say some really, really interesting slurs. I think there's going to be like, <laughs> yeah. like whatever they've got to say on the Mark Twain riverboat, I, I would suspect <laughs> The, the kind of the oddball prospector is like <laughs> saying like a kind of pretty like just like a pr pretty similar kind of closed vocabulary of slurs um which is a shame that we don't get to hear them in, in just like oh, you fucking like, sitters it's just some, nice it's something you would never expect to be like oh that guy is a real he looks like he's really into ceramics, if you know what I'm saying. It's like, I don't. I yeah. don't know no, what you're I saying. No, I don't. Please explain what you mean, Bernard, because I don't know what that means. <laughs> they decide, Eugene and Bernard decide, uh, on meeting this crazy prospector to not share the information with the authorities. Yep. They talk yeah. to a cop who confirms his story. Yep. And he's so... Like, this guy is Logan Smiler. And again, in It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, Jimmy Durante's character, who literally kicks the bucket when he dies, is named Smiler Grogan. Great. Love it. They have Real now, cool, Phil. Now Real Bernard cool and ref. Eugene have two halves of a treasure map. And this treasure map would take them to this underground river of gold, presumably. So Bernard drops Eugene off at a hotel room, and then he returns to find Eugene acting sus. Looks like he got quite a bit done already. Oh, yes. But I'm missing some vital information that I believe your half of the map can provide. Hmm. Yeah, sure. You you can have my half. It's, uh, it's right here in my... Good grief, what is that all over the table? A uh, table? Oh, just dust. Room service hasn't been in. But it... it looks like... gold dust. Gold? Gold? That's impossible. I mean, you must be mistaken. That's probably just some dirt. That glitters? I enjoy Will Ryan's choice of saying the word gulp. I think generally, like the, what sells all these episodes to me is also that the characters talk over each other a little bit. Mm -hmm. That there is sort of... Uh, I think that helps elevate the writing and makes it feel more natural, especially when the writing fails like it does in every single Phil Lawler episode. But yeah. uh, there is something interesting about like Eugene acting really nervous when like when, you know, Bernard comes in because, you know, he's hiding this chemistry set in the bathroom. Yeah, he's and got I, a Walter White setup going on. Yeah. Yeah, and I I genuinely thought that Eugene was building the chair from Burn After Reading. Like, in <laughs> what he is doing is testing the nugget of gold that they got from that prospector to see if it's real. And it turns out that it is, in yeah. fact, real gold. They each try to stay up later than the other because yeah, the one they each want annoying. to steal the other half of the map from each other. This ends in a stalemate, and so finally Bernard just fucking drugs Eugene. Well, that's the entrance to the cave. Yes, very clearly marked, as you can see. Ah. Old Mr. Smiler actually did quite a remarkable job. His directions are quite explicit. Oh, good. Then there won't be any trouble. None at all. We should be able to start at first light. So we should get a few hours of uh, sleep. What's the matter, Eugene? I don't know. Suddenly I'm feeling rather... Drowsy? Yes, I... The water! You put something in... The water. Oh, just a little sleeping powder. I, I mean, you need powder. your rest, Eugene. You've been up all day. You tricked me. Ah, oh, sorry, you. Fucking Bernard, man. What? <laughs> what the fuck? What the fuck, man? <laughs> yeah, no, he. Look, I'm not. I am not. I am no. I am no Eugene head. But like, <laughs> I re I really feel that some that. He should go back to the to the gay nerds because at least they don't do shit like this to him. <laughs> they don't roofie yeah. him. Yeah, no. They don't 
roofie him because they're bored of him speaking. He breaks him down. No mercy shown. Bernard goes down into the cave by himself in order to get all the gold for himself. I, I got really horrible flashbacks to the Mexico episode. Yeah, it's where similar feel. Yeah. yeah, it's very the same. And I was so I, I basically tuned out this entire section mm-hmm. until Eugene comes back. I, which... I, I mostly just clipped this to, to point this out. My matches are still dry. I'm in business. Listen to the music right here. Oh, my That is a reference to this the Mad, 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 Mad World once more. This when is the palm it. Trees. <laughs> An actual river of gold nuggets. <laughs> it's even more beautiful than the old man said. I'm rich. Rich. <laughs> I'm actually rich. Actually, I'm rich. So it turns out that Eugene has weaponized the state against Bernard. He has used bureaucracy to gain a claim to the cave that the river is in. But Bernard notes that actually the claim was only for the mouth of the cave and not the part of the cave that contains the gold itself. So they get in a big old fight. Eugene climbs up a rope. Uh, Bernard pulls it down. Eugene breaks every bone in his body (laughs) then they they come to an agreement Uh, of course you know the agreement will go poorly just as all the previous agreements where eugene has to sign over the cave entrance to bernard um so bernard will go out and get help but then as he does eugene handcuffs himself to bernard and dies (laughs) and then they both and then they both die yeah Yeah. the end is the end of eric von stroheim's silent film masterpiece greed based on the novel McTeague. Of course it is. Uh, and that it's the same thing. Someone gets handcuffed to the other guy. The other guy dies. And so he's just stuck out in the wilderness with the corpse. Great, great movie. Great movie. But they hit um, a bump in the road. And of course, oh, it actually was a story this whole time. Uh, oh, no. Uh, 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 fucking chicken shit. Yeah, it's, no. Oh, it's stand like, by your goddamn principles. Yeah, kill yes. Eugene and Bernard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's, I mean, look, if you really want to prove the point that experience for experience sake is worthless. <laughs> oh, good point. Good point. How better than to kill them and have them fucking die? You're exactly yeah. right. I am uh, I am notoriously bad for uh, guessing twists. Right. I can't do it. Like, I, I'm like, I'm even if I know that there is a twist coming, I like, I don't, I don't know what it is. I'll never be able to tell you what it is. I have been, I have, I have guessed a twist literally once in my entire life. <laughs> oh, and that was the first, that was the first season of True Blood. I, I consume media much like how I imagine a, a dog watches a fish <laughs> tank. I like, I like looking at it, but I'm not, I'm not taking anything in. It's I'm just kind of mm, kind of obediently mm, kind of looking at yeah. it, kind of, you know, like yeah. g- sort of gen- gently vibing. Yeah, I just like to take it as it comes. Um, this is not an this is not an interaction. I don't yeah. need to be involved in this. I just need to look. I just need to absorb. So, <laughs> like when I was listening to this, I was just like, they die. That's <laughs> that's it. They like they get they get like taken over by greed and then they die. That <laughs> that can't be. That can't be the that can't be the end of it. There's got to be some kind of. But even then, I still did not <laughs> clock that this was the story that was being told because I, I don't even have an excuse for myself. I just I was just <laughs> like, but but they but they're they're dead. Uh, is the next episode gonna be? Is the next episode gonna be like on the next series, like next kind of yeah. sort of series of episodes, just gonna be like absolutely fucking interminable discussions between Bernard and Eugene talking about whether or not they're going to heaven or whether or not there is such a thing as life after death. Oh, um, I love it goes that. very Samuel Beckett. Yeah. Oh, that was great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, and then like Eugene, like <laughs> a, lo- yeah. a, lo- a large man bursts into the cave with a little guy on a leash in tow, and they have a hole. <laughs> yeah, and like Eugene, like kind of bringing out like other belief systems and sort of saying like, why is it le- why is it more reasonable to believe that St Peter decides, or whether or, or why is that why is that so so much easier to believe than the idea of there being a jackal god who weighs your soul, and like and, and just that <laughs> just going on and on and on and on, and then event and then and then for some fucking reason the like the the moral of the story is that like uh is that eugene goes to heaven 
because uh, just for some just for some completely specious reason, and Bernard no, goes because to hell. Anubis is real. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Anubis. Yeah. Anubis yeah. appears it in the out, cave. Turns out Anubis is real. Yeah. Um, Both you yeah, so- and Hussein have come on this show and imagined a much, much, much better uh, <laughs> show than <laughs> Avengers and Odyssey yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Honestly, I, I, though, it's a, it's not even Anubis. He takes off the dog mask and it's the pig god. No. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 No, I think drapes them in all their finest skins. <laughs> I think the biggest lesson that we've learned is that if people want to have a better time listening to a show than listening to Adventures in Odyssey, uh, they ought to listen to Ten Thousand Posts, of all possible worlds, uh, yeah. and the worst of all possible worlds, and uh, you know, have a good time with those podcasts. Yeah. We yeah. kind of have come to the end of our regularly scheduled programming here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Phoebe, mm-hmm. is there anything that you would like? Well, first of all, obviously, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we yeah, had a great Phoebe. Time. Um, endured it, a lot of Americanisms today. Yeah, you really <laughs> yeah, thank you. went through it. So thank you for putting up with us. Is there anything that you would like to uh, pitch, plug, etc. before we uh, wrap it up here? You can hear more of my interesting misunderstandings of very simple media um, <laughs> over at uh, 10,000 Posts and also over at Masters of Our Domain, which is uh, the Seinfeld podcast that I do with Milo Edwards. Um, 10,000 posts I do with Hussein. So you'll, you'll be familiar with my co-hosts who have been on this show before. Uh, you can also, if you would like to, you could subscribe to my Substack, which is phoeberoy.substack.com. And the Substack is called the Tw- From the Twisted Mind of Phoebe, which I thought was really funny. And now I'm really sick of this name, but that's what I've called it. So <laughs> So that's what it's called now and like every time i have to say it, i'm just like yeah because it's supposed to be like you know when like when like horror directors like they haven't directed something but like yeah they've sort of kind of come up with the idea and so it's like you can't say they directed it but it's from the twisted mind of like and I you're going for really a garth morangi type thing basically I'm go- well, yeah it's, and it's I, Craven. So I thought that's that, what i always i, I like i so always I like was, i always so like i thought that was funny on, on something coming from a twisted mind i i'm i'm that this is for me this is, and yes. yeah, this is this is for you. Okay, well, I'm very very pl- I'm very very pleased to uh, be able to lay that at your feet. But yeah, like otherwise, thank you, thank you so much for having me. That was really Absolutely. fun. That was a real blast. Additionally, if you'd like more of our sick and twisted minds, we have a Patreon, Patreon.com/slash Worst of All, with a lot of great back catalog episodes, including the one uh, in Wits Endless Summer, just from a few weeks ago, where Hussein came on and uh, talked a few episodes of the show and made some uncanny predictions. So be (laughs) sure to check that out if you are interested. AJ, do you want to take us home? Absolutely. So I think there was a very interesting opportunity with these episodes to do something new for Odyssey, right? Because we've reached this point where there was a crossroads. We had lost, uh, you know, the great Hal Smith as wit and Odyssey could reinvent itself to be anything it wanted. And the thing that I actually enjoyed about these short trip episodes is that they did try and do that. Like they did try to find different formulas and at least tried to do new things, but often fell back on the same old fucking tropes that we've always known for <laughs> Odyssey. There was such a cool opportunity. They could have made seven of these episodes and done a, a deadly sin for each one of them or honestly do nine of them and have it be a literal adaptation of Dante's Inferno the fourth episode <laughs> is already greed like they're yeah, already almost point. there and you could make an argument that like the second one like Graham has like a lust for life and that's a second circle and the third one it's gluttony because you know it's like indulging too much in like your own familiar things ends up being unsatisfying or on the trail mix from yeah uh... on the trail mix yeah <laughs> and it's Bernard like literally walking through like this whole la- layer of shit of having to deal with this like you know these elite people like there is a way to like actually do something interesting, but instead they just kind of fall back on the same old tropes. And in the parlance of these episodes specifically, mm. if an experience isn't worth something unless you learn anything from it, then what a waste of fucking time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the worst of all possible AJs. I'm the worst of all possible Brian's. And I'm the worst of all possible Josh's. See you next week. <laughs>